time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. Seth Weintraub from 9 to 5 and Electric. Florence Ion from All About Android. Ben Thompson from WBUR. And, of course, we're going to talk about the new Samsung Folds and phones, including the Fold. Uh, Nokia's new camera phone announced at Mobile World Congress. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five. <laughs> five cameras. Microsoft's HoloLens 2 and a whole lot more. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 707, recorded Sunday, February 24th, 2019. Will it bend? This Week in Tech is brought to you by Quip. Get a fresh start every day with Quip, the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Visit getquip.com slash twit to get your first refill pack free when you purchase any Quip electric toothbrush. And by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com slash IT to see what IT can be by giving their products a try for free. And by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by... Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twit and using the promo code twit at checkout. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news starting a little early this week because of the Super Bowl. Nope, nope, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there, all the way. Thank you for laughing. Ben Brunch, Brock Johnson is here, all the way to my right. He's the senior producer at WBUR. Yes, uh, sir. Great to see you, Ben. Yeah, he, thanks for having me. He's in his it's been tiny, a little while. Thanks tiny, for having me back. Well, we love having you. It, you know, it's a, it's a rotation, like my friend. It's a rotation. Oh yeah, no, I love yeah. being in you, the rotation. You were on Good. the DL, but we've brought you back. He's I pitching. was in the cut. <laughs> in his tiny, you say this is your tiny studio, your tiny podcast. That's studio. behind me, the tiny podcast. Oh, look at that! <laughs> oh, it is tiny. There's a little cat. There's a tiny little cat oh. back there. Is a cat podcasting? She's sleeping right now. Oh, that's so that's cute. Bern, that's Bernadette. Bernadette, and she's surrounded yeah. by uh, soundproofing. Bernadette's she probably loves it in there. She has lots of feelings about foldable phones. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Good. We're gonna need that. Also with us, he uh, is the creator of Nine to Five Mac. 9 to 5, Google, and Electric Magazine, Seth Weintraub, legend in the industry. Great to have you, Seth. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Where are, where are you located? Are you in Brooklyn? I'm a little bit north of Brooklyn in Westchester. So uh, I see the about... sun shining, but the bushes seem to have something white on them. That's snow. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Is it cold? Yep, it is cold. <laughs> okay. It is very cold. Could you we spent us... the last week snowboarding, so. Oh, fun. Well, I appreciate yeah. you being here today. And joining Thank us you. in studio, and this is a huge sacrifice for her because she's missing the red carpet. <laughs> I'm secretly watching it on my Chromebook while oh, we're good. doing this. You could do that. I wouldn't. Uh, Pluto we could TV put it up streaming, there. So. Are you a Pluto TV gal? Not oh, a Google yeah. TV? Oh, yeah. I'm, a YouTube TV? Why I do you like got, I just got an Android TV yesterday, Leo. Oh, I which one? I just installed the Mi Box. The Mi I Box? I bought it from Walmart, yeah. I never heard of the Mi Box. Yeah, Andy and Anako bought one last year, and he encouraged me to to move to it, and I decided to move to you it, like and it? I installed it last night. It has a real physical remote. I don't have to <gasps> use my phone if I don't Shocking. want to. I could just talk into it. I have a Google, the Shield, the NVIDIA Shield, which is yes, a great Android TV it device. It still is after all these years. I do feel dopey, though, using a uh, game controller to change channels. It's just kind of weird. It's great using a remote. I, I missed <laughs> yeah, it. It's nice. The remote's back. Florence, of course, a host of All About Android. And you, yesterday, were at, not yesterday, Wednesday, were at the Samsung I was. event where they announced the about eight phones. and At least eight. A dishwasher. And <laughs> I don't know what else. They did it pretty quickly. They, they breezed through it. And they did something opposite of Apple. Usually Apple saves the best for last. Right. One more thing, right? They launched with the phone, the Fold. 
They Galaxy also Fold. did did something that I don't know. Maybe this was good. Maybe maybe bad. They announced the price, <laughs> and then everybody audibly booed in the gas. <laughs> yeah, April twenty sixth. It's the first, actually, the second foldable phone uh, after the Royal. Uh, and it is, but it's from Samsung, so it'll be nicely made. It has a Samsung makes a screen. Yeah. Did you get to see it? Nope. I saw it from. I saw it in DJ Co's hands, very far away, but. Again, that was very far so away. So it wasn't in the demo room. Absolutely not. All the other stuff was. In fact, you brought us some Google, some buds. I yeah, almost call them Google buds. Some, They're Samsung buds. Some buds. Uh, some buds. Those look pretty sweet. And those sweet. have a wireless charging uh, case, Did unlike the magnets. Apple AirPods. How do they work? Oh, and they have magnets to hold okay. the things in. So oh, when they announced whoa. that the Fold was $1,980, there was an audible gasp. It was a, whoa. But it's not even yeah. the most expensive folding phone no, now. Today, not. Huawei announced the Mate X, which folds. So, so, you know, the best way to describe, uh, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but the best way to describe the Galaxy Fold is to take two phones mm -hmm. and put them together. That's, it's going to be thick like that. And then you, then one, ha one side, put the screen on one side. So it's a little, it's a small screen, but four inch screen on that. And then you open it up. And that's the bigger screen. Yep. But if you do that, you realize it's not that big. It's kind of squarish big. It's tablet sized, nearly. Well, nearly. Would Some be. of them go into eight inches. Some of them go into well, seven inches. So that's the Galaxy Fold. But then the Mate X goes the other <laughs> goes the other way. So oh, it goes like a temple. Oh. It's so weird. So you see both screens on it. We've created a mock-up. To help you understand it, I don't know how this is better in any way. <laughs> well, it's a little easier. On and you. You it's don't a little confusing because to... it seems to be made of old iPhones. <laughs> but I'll hide the I'll hide the Apple logo. So the screen goes all the way around the outside. I, yeah. Which but is, is there a piece cut out of that one, Leo? Like, because it sort of folds into itself, right? The, there's a little line where the cameras are on. Yeah, it's a trifold. For the mate, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of weird. It's weird, but I kind of like it. Don't I mean, you worry like about the, the hinge, though? See that where that screen is? Yeah. Isn't well, it that's gonna... why they're letting not letting anybody look at it. Same or thing hold with the it. Galaxy Fold. I, yeah. How, how, these are polymer screens, so they're yeah. flexible. But I Polite. worry how, how, you know, is you going to be able to open it 10 times and then it breaks? That's what I'm thinking, too. Like an old Trapper Keeper. Yeah. They were made of plastic. <laughs> they would fall apart halfway through the school year. It's a Galaxy Trapper Keeper. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a better name. I think that's a better name. <laughs> you know, nostalgia is very hot right now for my generation. You want to sell it to me, right? We're the spenders right now, so. Yeah, but that's a, I think even your generation ain't going to spend 3000 <laughs> no. I didn't mention. We don't have the money. <laughs> so the Galaxy Fold's 1980. The Huawei, what was it, 2600 bucks? 2300 for the base model or yeah, whatever. Yeah, don't make the American government well, look at you. Well, and that's the thing. You won't be able to buy it in the U.S., so yeah. you don't even have to think about well, it. Well, if you happen to bring it over from overseas or buy Actually, it on AliExpress. You can buy. I bought a, a P20, even mm -hmm. though it wasn't sold in the U.S. I was able to buy it yeah. through some sort of online thing. The carriers won't sell it, and Huawei doesn't officially sell it in the U.S. I asked Huawei about that, and they said, if you don't have a carrier deal in the United States, there's no point in marketing true. a phone. You're not going to sell an appreciable number. Very true. Tell that to Google, though. They've done all right. With, well, I guess the Pixel has a, has a Verizon and T-Mobile carrier deal. So maybe that's yeah. okay. OnePlus was the one that... Um, they tried. They, they did the reservation well, system. Well, no, they're with T-Mobile now. Yeah. And they work on Verizon, which has been great for them. I mean, that's really helped their, yeah. their you bottom need, line. You need that. So, uh, Seth, you're the richest guy here. We <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> We're just podcasters, which is... You're a publisher. Which is the is is either of these foldable phones? I think there's more, right? This isn't the only one. There's going to be a ZTE foldable phone and too. a TC, TCL. TCL. Yes. TCL. I always want to say TLC. That's not. That's just Rest in my peace, favorite. Lisa Left Eye Lopez. Yes. I always want to say Tickle. Didn't Xiaomi have a trifold coming? Yeah. Their CEO, the CEO in a tweet sat there unfolding and folding it, but that to me that doesn't really count as even a prototype. It's just. It's just fun. Well, these order. things are barely prototypes, the ones that they're announcing. Well, I mean, you know, at that price and, and you know, they're not letting the journalists even right. hold them or take them home or anything. So to me, it's kind of like, you know, we'll price them so high that almost nobody buys them or wants to buy them. We'll make a very small number of these 
and uh, we'll get our beta testers, uh, you know, to pay for it, pay for the the devices. So you wouldn't rush this? out April 26th. Isn't that far off? You wouldn't rush out April 26th and buy a Galaxy Fold. Well, it's kind of crazy. I mean, uh, Vlad Savoff from uh, The Verge was was discussing like if this is coming out April and they're not giving it, like they're not letting journalists touch it yet. What is like what is happening between now and April that's going to make these things ready for they're for developers? Uh, they're for developers, I think. Yeah, it's it's definitely got a yeah. prototypey exactly. developer feel to it. That's what um, it sounds and, like. Like when Project Tango came out, right? And it was just it was like six hundred dollars. That was really clunky it was like, phone. It was, too. but the idea was to be a reference device, and this is just Samsung saying, "Hey, come to us for the reference device." You don't need to go to Google. We'll do it. Yeah. And look, Google and, supports and, us. You know, the form factor, like, it's cool. Like, I definitely yeah. would love to show people this. But, like, in day-to-day -day use, like, you know, when I'm at mobile, I'm on. I'm probably using one hand. I'm yeah. walking. I don't want to unfold it and, you know, fold it back up. And, you know, and then, yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't. This doesn't appeal to me it in a way spark that... spark joy for you. You know who... The, yeah. No. You're doing Marie Kondo. <laughs> I know. I, it's, I yeah, you. I've really killed that joke, too, because I've said it too much on all that. So I have, to, I have to say, I know the audible gasp, but the reason Samsung said several times $1,980 is, here's a phone that's very distinctive. If you go to a meeting and you pull it out of your pocket and you open it up, everybody's going to go, oh, he has the $2,000 phone. That is the point of it at least in some markets is I that totally agree I, I yeah. feel like it's going to be one of those phones that that is it's sort of like a gimmick in some ways but it is also it's it's made for a very small group of people it's a, it's the luxury of luxury devices the right it's this call. like yeah it's it's this crazy phone that that if you pull it out of your pocket people will at least for a very short time be impressed well maybe. i mean apple sold what was it an eighteen thousand dollar apple watch when they first came out i never saw anyone with solid it, though. gold yeah, but I mean, the people, get better friends. But it's get a status symbol. If you are wearing a solid gold Apple Watch, people know. Oh, he spent twenty grand on that. Yeah, it's like having a big diamond or something. Yeah, it does look cool, though. I mean, I I feel like I don't know what the the sci-fi reference is, right? But. But That's the part of the problem is there isn't is one. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because if you watch The Expanse, the phones are like these clear, expandable sort of things versus these like physical, clunky. And even 2001, they had an iPad. Yeah. But they didn't, right. they didn't fold them. I don't think anybody in science fiction anticipated the idea that the screens would be so flexible. That's very true, I think. Yeah. That seems a little odd that they can do that. It does. Isn't there circuitry on the back of it? Isn't it going to get... Metal fatigue or something? As you, is the it going to wrinkle? Samsung phones have two batteries. <clears throat> Even the Huawei looked like it had a wrinkle where the where the hinge is. Yeah, it's a little like wobbly. It's yeah. wobbly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know the where the hinge is. They they had the phones on max brightness, so if, if there was any darkness, it would kind of ah. blur it out. Uh, so, that's right. I heard I, about look that. Look at this. Look at this right here. Look at that hinge. First of all, this is the Huawei hinge, which is kind of funky. It looks like they're glued in. And look at that perceptible like bulge the over the hinge. The bracelet. Do you very... want that in your screen? I don't think so. No. So then you got that big chunk on the right too. Yeah, I don't know what that. So that it looks like the charging port. Yeah, there's your Type C connector. It is very. Thin. Are they are they just trying to figure out how to make people buy tablets again? <laughs> that is a great question. I think they're desperate. <laughs> they're desperate. There's nothing to distinguish any of the current flagship phones. They're all slabs of black glass, all of them. But it is innovative still. Because, so well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They need something that looks different. And I don't. I don't think market research. I don't. I don't think this is driven by research and this is what people are demanding. This is more throw a spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, right? Mm -hmm. Or no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Eventually yes. it will lead to other things. I like to think of the... I like to think of this being used for kind of all-in-one devices, I think for like a different kind of market. Maybe not necessarily like the high-end market, but a market of people who just would like to have a two-in-one sort of device because maybe that is that is the only thing that's accessible to them and they would like to have that sort of portability and that malleability. Do you and think so. it's possible this is for the Asian market? Because I remember in the, in Japan 20, 15 years ago, long before the iPhone came out, 
there were all these interesting oddball folding phones, lots more capabilities than anything we had in the States. And I was told at the time, well, the reason is people don't have, they don't have the room for personal computers. Yeah. So their phone is their computer. And so they have odd form factors because they're more functional. That's what I think about beyond Asia too. I think also Latin America yeah. and, and other markets where this could so really maybe come that, handy. Maybe we don't appre fully appreciate the So value. this is going to become, the more this becomes commoditized, I think the more <gasps> we'll see a market for it. I think right now it very much is, well, how can developers <laughs> and... I think this is very much uh, an offering for, for people who want to explore that market and who are interested in it. Were there, is there, you've been, I'm sure, watching Barcelona today. Uh, were there any other uh, announcements? Off Twitter, yes. Yeah. <laughs> or any, anything else that uh, LG announced a new G8? LG, I feel bad for LG. It's, if they're, they're not even the also ran. I mean, they have nice phones. This I wouldn't feel the bad for them. They they are the other half of the South Korean tech market. They have it. They have other markets. They have a lot stuff. Yeah. of stuff there. They own a lot. I mean, they own beauty brands. They have appliances. There's LG they, Beauty. Yeah, they're they're uh, the brands have different other names, but if you wow. look at the umbrella company, they're the ones. There's like an LG How home division. I didn't know that. Yeah. They own products like Belief is a brand that they own. Nokia, uh, which the only claim to fame Nokia had was it made the only decent Windows phones. And one of the reasons they were so decent is they had a, a lot of a 41 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. They called it Pure View. Well, they're back. The new Nokia <laughs> flagship has spider eyes. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven it cameras. Like it looks like when you look at like, a spider's face. Like, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Why indeed? Uh, it, it, there's a 12 megapixel, all 12, all all whatever have a 12 megapixel sensor and an f1.8 lens. Uh, it almost looks like a joke. Only two. Like it's a, like an Onion article. <laughs> it is. A, it's crazy. <laughs> I guess they're not all. I don't know. There's five lenses, and I see on here seven things. Um, One there looks are like a flash. There, are two of the five cameras shoot in color. The other three are monochrome. When you press the shutter, all five cameras shoot different exposures at the same time. And then they merge them together. This is kind of what the Pixel does with one lens very quickly uh, into a, a single ultra-detailed shot. And Nokia says that individual cameras can even shoot multiple exposures on their own and add even more data to the final image. The result, a camera that offers new levels of detail and color. Yeah, flash... And then there's some other sensors. So there's really only five cameras. I see that when I... I People are those. liking the Nokia Android phones. <clears throat> they're doing well. I mean, they're doing... They are they have some relative traction, I should say. We should also point out they're not really made by Nokia. They're no. made by uh, across the street. HMD Global. <laughs> Just right across the street in Espoo from Nokia. and But they have the Nokia brand. Mm -hmm. They're licensing uh, the brand. The Can pictures. I ask you a question about the foldable phones that I couldn't figure out? Yeah. Is it going to get? Are these phones going to have more battery power and last longer, or is it because of the size of the screen? It 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 requires the two batteries. So I was a little surprised because I couldn't figure that out. The Samsung Fold only had a four thousand or forty one hundred milliamp hour battery, which is not. When I heard that, I was like, "Is that enough?" <laughs> not, not better, huge. right? <clears throat> the Huawei has two cells, right? One in each. Flap, mm -hmm. and I think it's right. more, it's higher, uh, but it's still not as high. I don't know for a, for a thing that because that's what I'm tablet. waiting for is a better battery. Yeah, so it's, it's funny like if, they're if throwing. You make they're me trying, buy two. Okay. Yeah, they're trying all these crazy things, but really, just you know, one thing they could do bring back the removable battery. I always would buy with Samsung early galaxies. I'd buy two batteries. And then I'd go as long as I could with one, and usually that was most of the day. And then if I needed it, I got off the airplane mm -hmm. and it was dead, I'd open up the back, put in another battery, and I'm good to go. Yeah. That's true. That's an easy thing to do. I don't understand. I don't. Anyway, they're all, if you want, we can look at these pictures. This is, these are from the Nokia, and they, they look great, but I, you can never trust, uh, you know, the, can, the, the pictures. It that, takes a while to figure out the real <laughs> capabilities of a smartphone camera. Actually, these, um, are these shot by The Verge? Maybe these are shot by The Verge. I guess they are. Uh, but why there's a shower outside Mobile World Congress is beyond. Maybe they're not shot by The Verge. I don't know what's going oh, on. Oh, uh, they might be in a pool area. Okay. There is depth. <laughs> Just, uh, I don't know. Bring so, context to it. Things are strange in uh, um, in uh, Finland. Um, there's a sandwich. 
delicious. I mean, it actually kind of it doesn't look very. I mean, it looks kind of lifeless to me. It looks. <clears throat> it looks uh, like very accurate, which you know, if you're used to Samsung, which <sighs> pops colors, accurate actually does feel like a little bit. Lifeless. Now, have you seen the comparisons from the folks who have uh, the GS10 on the ground? In M at MWC right now no, what versus does it look the like? Pixel threes. Oh, that's, this uh, is the question. I apologize. I'm coming out of this out of the blue, and we don't have anything to show. But I'll find it. I'll find it. But you know, people have been posting on Twitter because they have the GS tens in their hand, and you can still see that they're doing that thing where they over process, over saturate a photo versus the Pixel three, which also processes the photo, but it processes it processes it, it ugh, to make it look uh, more realistic. So it's a very, just to show their side by side processing yeah, and how I've like seen, Samsung uh, really tries to make it pop. Google's night shot compared to the low light photography on the Samsung, which doesn't even come close. But you could argue that the Google Pixel is over brightening because in dark images it looks like the lights are on. Yeah, is over brightening it. Uh, the Samsung seems to do a fairly decent job, but nowhere near as much detail. I it, that's the that's the kicker. The detail is not yeah. as good. And then Samsung over sharpens as well, which always bothers which me. If you pixel kinda, people, if yeah. you zoom in, you really see that over sharpening. Yeah, I agree. On the other hand, uh, Samsung's got the best screens by far. There's no question. <clears throat> when I uh, go from my Apple, uh, which I mean, this is an OLED screen, the 10s Max, <clears throat> or the Pixel 3 XL, to my uh, Note 9, it's just like it, my eyes go whoa, because it, the Note 9 looks so much better, crisper, and brighter. No, Samsung gives itself the best screens, right? Exactly. They like, don't sell them to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course not. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there there is a lot more uh, new stuff to talk about. And we uh, I got up early this morning. Early for me is nine a.m. to uh, cover the Microsoft right. Hololens of a two announcement. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's lots to talk about. We have a busy news day, but fortunately, we have the A team with us. Florence Ion from All About Android. Great to have you. Oh, that flow. I love the earrings. Thank you. <laughs> She's wearing red pom-pom yes. earrings. Danglies. They're really cute. Uh, we also have, uh, they look like my poodle. No, I don't have a poodle. We also say, is your poodle, poodle tail. Dyed red? <laughs> <laughs> I have a red poodle. <laughs> Seth Weintraub is also here from 9 to 5 and electric. Great to have you, Seth. I'm going to ask you about electric vehicles in a, in a little bit because I'm in the market. And, All right. Yeah. And Ben Brock Johnson, I'm going to ask you about tiny podcast studios in a little bit because I'm in the market. He's a senior Sounds producer good. at WBUR Radio. A uh, <clears throat> quick program note, we are doing our survey. If you haven't done it yet, uh, there's still time, but only a little time left. Once a year, we ask the audience to fill out a few questions to so we can get to understand and know you better. And if you haven't done it, no obligation, but I'd appreciate it if you do at twit.to slash survey19. Quip is the first... Subscription electric toothbrush uh, accepted by the American Dental Association. It is a really neat idea. You know, you can get a Quip for $25. They have more expensive ones, but they start at $25, which means you can afford an electric toothbrush. It's great because it's battery-powered, which means it's great for travel. It goes months on one battery, uh, AAA battery, and it also means it's more compact. So Quip, I love this, comes with a, a holder, which you can... Mount to your mirror. The multi-use cover can be a stand. Could You could mount it to your mirror, which is what I do, so you never forget to brush. But it also could turn around and cover the head, and then it's per, it's like the smallest, most compact travel uh, toothbrush. And because you don't need a charger, you just put another AAA battery, and it's great for traveling. It's as lightweight as you can get. I love Quip. And Quip does something else that's very cool. It's a it's a, a great electric toothbrush. I I should mention this. You, you know, you, it's got... Great sonic vibrations to clean your teeth effectively without pressing too hard. I think a lot of people with electric toothbrushes really push hard. It's gentle on sensitive gums. Some electric toothbrushes really are quite abrasive. I've had my dentist tell me, don't push so hard. They actually had to show me. You never have that problem with the Quip. They're, it's a nice, gentle, and just like, uh, you know, it's got two-minute timer, pulses every 30 seconds. So you, you make sure you get your whole mouth switch sides and all that. So that's really good. Uh the other thing they do that's really great is you also get brush heads automatically delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months, just $5. Uh, I also get new toothpaste delivered because I like the little the little travel uh, tubes. 
And that way you're not using old brushes. And three out of four of us use bristles that are old, worn out, and ineffective. <clears throat> That's why Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the ADA. They have thousands of verified five-star reviews, over 20,000 professionals backing it. I am a Quip Quipper for life. I love Quip. And starting at just $25, you could do it too. If you go to getquip.com slash twit, we'll even throw in your first refill pack free when you purchase any Quip electric toothbrush. Well, I have, we have his and her Quips. Get your first refill pack free. Getquip.com slash twit. It's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash twit. And we thank Quip for their support. So uh, I'm probably the only one who actually watched the HoloLens announcement, I'm guessing. Flo? No. I was asleep. Seth? No. <laughs> I read I about it afterwards. watched it on the internet. Did you watch it? Not, the, not the actual vis uh, video, Twitter. but I watched the yeah. reaction. Yeah. So remember four years ago when HoloLens 1 was announced, Microsoft showed games. Um, you know, it, it, they, they did Minecraft. They had spiders mm -hmm. from Mars. They had all sorts of stuff. No games this time. Microsoft doubled down on industrial applications. They showed fixing engines, designing theater sets, op practicing a surgery before you actually did it. Uh, they showed new user interface gestures, which I was very impressed with. We did a live stream of it with Mary Jo Foley. And uh, while she had, I think, been pre-briefed a, a lot of it, uh, it was very impressive. And the only gaming concession to gaming or even any consumer application at all was about a three-minute visit from Tim Sweeney of Epic. Mm -hmm. who said, this is going to be great for games, didn't demo right. anything, and left. Uh, oh, well, I heard the Unreal Engine will work with it this morning. Yeah. So, yeah. cool. <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> it's really, they really pushed Azure. They pushed the cloud. They pushed enterprise uses. That's the money ticket. I think this is yeah. the new Microsoft. It's really interesting. To They're leaning in yeah. to it. Satya is leaning them into it. And I was, I, a lot of the opinion pieces I read this morning that came out about it were like, this is going to be really helpful in industrial spaces where tech still needs, well, tech really hasn't penetrated yet. Like this, this is going to help. Yeah. Um, it is a little pricey. So the original right. HoloLens developer kit, which has been around for four years, was $5,000. This is thirty-five hundred dollars. It's a lot of money. But they, I think they did offer something that will be compelling to many businesses. It's one hundred twenty-five dollars a month per seat if you commit to three years, which ends up being the same amount. But I think, I think a lot of businesses would prefer that they can. I'm sure they appreciate it. Subsidize it, maybe <clears throat> have a program to subsidize it. For well, if you multiply twelve times one hundred twenty-five times three, I think it comes out more than more than thirty-five hundred yeah. bucks. But. Uh, I, knowing how business works, I know it would be a lot easier for us to say 125 bucks a month and 3,500 bucks yeah. out the door. And I think they they also showed a conferencing, a weird looking. Uh, we can we'll, we can show some video of it if we have it lying around. But it was very creepy uh, video conferencing. You'd be wearing this thing, and they say much more comfortable. It feels like a hat. It it was true that everybody put it on and just kind of they put it on. It didn't, wasn't a lot of tweaking and adjusting as there used to be with the old HoloLens. It just worked. It looked like sunglasses up to the brow, and then it was just this massive thing with a forehead suction cup. Oh, my gosh. And, and it goes around your head. It's battery-powered. Uh, I was told about three hours of battery life, which is decent. There's no tether. You don't carry around a computer with you, except that's what the HoloLens is. In fact, it runs Windows. Um, and uh, they demonstrated this conferencing. So the conferees would both be wearing HoloLens, they can see through the sunglasses part, but they also can see projected onto their meeting room the other conferee. The way they, the reason it looked creepy is the conferee, the other people would use a 2D picture. The the HoloLens has time of flight sensors for 3D. It has the connect sensor on top. So I guess I guess they didn't show it working, but I guess you'd show the 2D picture to the HoloLens, and that would turn it into a 3D avatar view that was creepy as hell. And then you'd be in the room with other people. But what's neat is they could, you could both be looking at a 3D generated model. You could send each other images and pictures. They could have a virtual whiteboard that you'd all be working on. So I think it was kind of fun. I was just going to say that reminds me of those 3D pillows that you get printed out of a picture. Yeah, it's exactly like that. Or if you've ever done <laughs> it Bitmoji, like it it's, or the Galaxy. Yeah. Remember the Galaxy? It's creepy like that. Oh, they have new ones with the, sorry, that's a Samsung thing. 
I was going to say. Yeah. They have new isn't, isn't the holographic uh, field of view or whatever it is bigger? They said like twice can, as big, but they <clears throat> they didn't say yeah. twice. And I don't think it's twice as wide. I think it's twice as tall. So that's a twice that, as tall. That was yeah. a big problem with HoloLens 1 because it was like a mail yeah. slot. Yeah, that's what I remember trying it. It was like really amazing in the field of view, and out, but but it was hard for it to be truly immersive. Really, right. I, I yeah. mean, I know it's mixed reality, but it it was hard for you to really kind of dig into it in in a way. And I think that was partially the field of view. So it was good. I, I thought it was good to hear that they had extended that. Um, and I think. I don't know. I mean, the business move makes a lot of sense to me, right? That these are the, these are the company, you know, companies are going to be able to afford this and can actually find, I mean, I, I've talked to companies in Massachusetts that are, that are already using HoloLens, the, the first version, uh, for, for things like turbine, uh, maintenance. Yes. Um, and I think that it, it really does have those applications where you can have somebody who is, you know, who's an engineer and who's trained, but at the same time may not know, uh, everything about this particular engine and run a software program that helps him, uh, or her understand, um, you know, how to repair something or how to tweak it, how to change it. I, I can see that application being really smart. It, it does have an AI engine in the, in the he headset. <clears throat> and, it, and it actually did seem to do a very good job of things like recognizing your hands. So if your hands get in the field of view of the headset, they are now, you're now seeing a three-dimensional version of your hands. They've got new uh, gestures that I think make a lot of sense. Uh, they had an excellent uh, demo uh, by a millennial showing she played the piano she uh, pinched and zoomed it really was impressive here's a in their uh, trailer video an example of a motorcycle mechanic looking at uh, you know the map of what he's going to fix and then seeing what he should do and I think yeah. this all makes a lot of sense that's how we're seeing Google Glass use here's a surgeon oh, practicing yeah. open heart surgery before she actually does it yes please <laughs> yeah please please <laughs> practice <laughs> And you can see, if you look at it, that looks like a fairly comfortable uh, headset. I love it that there's no tether. I, clearly, th this is a set designer now uh, designing her set in the theater, but there's no real set. It's just being so superimposed. This is the new... <clears throat> this is the new... Uh, it's a new workstation kind exactly. of thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I've, I've played with Magic Leap. Uh, I don't think Magic Leap has as coherent a vision and certainly doesn't have the ecosystem Microsoft yeah. offers. I think this is... They're right now clearly the leader in AR. I mean, there's nobody even close. And they know who to go after, which is their existing customers, yeah. which is enterprise. And the military. Exactly. Well, um, yes. they didn't mention that. <laughs> there was. You don't say. <laughs> yesterday, we got news that about 50 Microsoft employees had signed a uh, open letter mm -hmm. to uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, saying, please don't. Uh, they apparently signed a half billion dollar contract with the Department of Defense to use HoloLens in military applications. Um, no mention of that. In fact, no mention of military use at all. There was a there was a discussion, or rather, what I saw on Twitter was that people were quoting Satya talking about AI and how it's going to exist in the future, and a lot of the subtweets of that were well. Yeah. Military. Well, you could, you know, right now, I know there's drone pilots wearing headsets of some kind, probably not augmented reality, probably virtual reality headsets to pilot those drones. Um, military uses that. This is not as big as the Jedi, the billion dollar uh, or $10 billion Jedi contract. Um, it's interesting that Microsoft's, you know, Microsoft's response to this, at least such as I saw it, was essentially, we're the best of the best, and why not have the best of the best uh, informing the military as the military does work that is important for, you know, um, keeping America safe, for lack of a better term. Uh, but I do... It, it it does make me wonder, right? Because in theory, this is this is why people criticize like the military industrial complex, right? Is is this this situation where um, the government is contracting out work to the private industry, and all of these people now have to work on something that maybe helps kill someone somewhere, uh, and those people don't get to work on helping the pianist play the piano mm -hmm. or yeah, helping the set designer yeah. do the set designer stuff, and so. I mean, it's a small number of people who signed this this letter, obviously, but I, I thought that was an interesting story this week. It, only, it is only 50. I mean, Microsoft has yeah. tens of thousands of employees, but this is something that's been happening all over Silicon Valley. Google 
decided not to pursue the Jedi contract uh, because of uh, employee revolt, and Amazon ended up doing it. And Jeff Bezos stepped forward and said, look, this is patriotic. It's kind of interesting. When did it become unpatriotic to help with the nation's defense? Yeah. I, and I, I don't disagree well. with that. I mean, <laughs> it's easier to say if you don't pay any taxes like Jeff Bezos yeah. doesn't. Zero taxes. Know. I got to do something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the, some of the video uh, from this. Here's the uh, the young woman. Azure uh, Connect. That's so they're a... also selling a three was a three or four hundred dollar version of the Connect designed for business. It's essentially the sensors that are hmm. uh, part of the uh, HoloLens in a professional box. In a in a box. It's not a it's not a webcam though. It's it's a it's I, it's a designed to do something. I don't know what. I don't understand it. But you can pre-order it now at azure.com slash connect, I note. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, this is the creator, uh, kind of mad scientist uh, creator of both Connect and HoloLens. Uh, and he spent a lot of time uh, on stage. Um, I don't know. I, I, I actually have kind of admire the new uh, Microsoft. I feel like they have turned this company around. They're smart to focus on cloud and enterprise. There's, you know, a lot of big money to be made there. There's the uh, as, there's the original HoloLens being used in the International Space Station on the right there. I agree. I, I mean, I think, you know, they've been, for the past five, seven years, I've been really impressed with the direction of the company. Um, and I think also it's really, you know, it's interesting to see this this story this week about Apple systematizing its software across platforms or or starting on that because Microsoft already did that, right? I mean, the Windows Phone is long gone by now, but I think they've it's they've been leading in some really interesting areas, uh, and Hololens is a great example yeah, of that. Yeah. Well, Apple's made a lot of noise about doing augmented reality. We haven't seen a product. Google had Glass. I don't think that's anything to write home about. Um, there's Magic Leap, and as I said, I played with the Magic Leap, but mostly it's games. Uh, I get it's some. There are some industrial uses. Google Glass, by the way, still is used in industrial. That's true. Ways. Yep. But nothing uh, like this. And this is uh, Seth that two X um, view, and I think it is. Uh, I think it's taller. I don't think it's uh, wider because it was wide enough. It was, and what you see, and I should point this out when you use one of these devices. When we talk about a field of view, it's not like the rest of it's black. It's just that the images that you're seeing with their special camera, that they look like they're full, you know, full screen images, fit within that view. And if you move your head and they go outside the the edge of that, they just disappear. You still see the world around you, but they just the, the objects you're looking at only appear within that uh, somewhat narrow field of view. So, right. Center of gravity in the middle. That's a big deal because uh, the imbalanced HoloLens got very tiring very quickly. Um, here's Julia Schwartz. She did a great job demoing this. She's the millennial I was referring to. Uh, and apparently it takes a millennial to really understand how to do this. You can see she, the thing can see her hands. She can move her hands. And that means a whole world of gestures are available. It was a little clunky in HoloLens 1. It took some getting used to you this is much easier now. see she can see the edges of where that image is she can touch it with her hands she can zoom it nice. she can pinch it she can spin it it's a full artifact yeah it's like a thing mm. yeah the thing that's weird is you're not touching anything so while it's reacting to your touch it's not like your hand stops right so she showed a little later on she showed how they're working on new gestures like pinch gestures where your fingers tap each other and the pinch gesture does give you something to to stop your finger. But she's talking about how you push push buttons are different. Um, the size of the button determines how you interact with it. If it's a bigger button, you might punch it. Uh, can, can we just appreciate that even in this uh, in this interactive environment, the slider is still a slider, and you know yeah. the file system is still <laughs> like the static file system. It's just a look. It looks like it's in three D because it's floating. Yeah. Well, there is a holographic <laughs> version point. of Windows that is that dopey. You know, explorers floating I mean, in space. It's like <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, world. you've got to obviously invent a new vocabulary. But you can't get so far from the old vocabulary. It's That's true, because then it becomes unfamiliar to those of us who have been living in this world. We're still in the skeuomorphic stage of yeah. uh, holographic yeah. interfaces. It just feels, it feels somewhat antiquated. So do you, so do you think you, you're going to see people on airplanes and subways yes. with, with these on, and they're, and gonna they're gonna just going to be doing yeah. their things? But remember how crazy we thought people with Bluetooth headsets looked for a while, just 
animatedly talking as they walk down the street. Now we're used to it. I think, you, And now we just accept AirPods like they don't look stupid. Yeah, they still look stupid. <laughs> But, they, they but everybody's look, wearing like, them. Yeah, they still look like Q-tips in your Sorry. hair. Yeah. But no, but that's find, right. People you get like used to them because they're very convenient. Yeah. Yeah, true. Um, these do, the HoloLenses do flip up, kind of like clip-ons. So you could kind of look normal, <laughs> except that you're wearing a helmet. Well, uh, but it's becoming normalized the more we wear these things. Yeah. You know? I mean, if the guy if the guy sitting next to you on the airplane was had like an Oculus on... And he was just going at nuts with his arms and flailing everywhere. I would be annoyed. Would, oh, God. Would that be, like, could you call this? Stu the flight Stewardess, attendant say, he's annoying me. I as long as so. I don't hear it, and as long as you don't touch me, we're fine. Yeah, get off my armrest. <laughs> like, there's a new thing now where people apparently, if they don't have headphones, they'll still listen to their content on the plane, which is not okay. That I really hate. Oh, no. And you see that with people talking that, on their phone on the plane. Oh, uh, Mm. Not, okay. not okay but it's better that you can imagine the hololens is a lot better right in in that kind of public scenario than actual virtual reality and i do remember people right. making the argument that people were actually going to be wearing these things and effectively blinding themselves uh in public to the actual real That's world around nuts. them and that made no <laughs> sense no. to me like that like I've ridden the New York subway long enough to know that you want as many of your senses around you as possible. Yeah. yeah. Here's the when creepy. You're in public. Let me go go back a little bit in this. Uh, in this, this is in Gadget's edited video. This is the uh, uh, demonstration from the folks at Spatial of the kind of creepy teleconference. But as somebody in the chat room pointed out, mm. this isn't about seeing each other as much as it is about seeing a shared knowledge space with objects in it. So even though this looks kind of weird and jerky and and so forth it's really the data that you're sharing and the things you're working on together uh this is uh mattel was mm -hmm. showing how they might work on toys their their employees mm -hmm. are all over the place but they can sh work in a shared space together um as if they're meeting in the same room yeah I I was thinking this sort of thing would be really cool, you know, as it advances to maybe help people who have anxiety about being out in the world, something that they could wear. Yeah. Just so we need another reason for people to stay in their mom's basement. Or get them out of it. Or maybe get them <laughs> with out of a, it slowly but surely. You know, with something that would help them see the world. So, but this isn't the know. form factor forever. This is today's True. form factor. This is, this is the Commodore 64 form factor, right? We're at yeah. the early... I think Mr. Eh, no I Pants like is, Sega you're Genesis. right, Mr. No Pants is weird. Mr. No Pants, <laughs> Mr. Is, no super Pants weird. is creepy, right? That we're talking about, the, yeah, he, 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 he stops at the waist. Not only no pants, no pants, no legs, apparently. I know nothing. Yeah. Speaking uh, of No Pants, are we all, I'm you know, I, don't wanna, I don't want to be the one to say this, but <laughs> oh. is this, this seems obvious use for porn. Oh, like, you think? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't that drive all technology anyway? All right, like, so we're going to go there. Let's go there. Humans are lonely. <laughs> um, but wait, we have, we've had VR time. porn for a while. Is it yeah. huge? I don't know. Is it big? It's been around for a couple of years. I remember trying it. It's massive, it. Leo. It's massive. <laughs> it's not as big as it appears in the mirror. It's, uh, it's um, I think it's a gimmick, but I'm not yeah. sure. I don't know because I haven't kept up on the numbers I tr you know, when it first came out, I said, well, I have to see this. And it was actually a little disturbing because yeah. um, it's like you're really there. It is very real, uh, maybe too real. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, I, don't I wonder know. if Pornhub has ever put out the numbers on that because they're super, you know, they're always like putting out data. Oh, wait, on, don't, yeah, I was going to say, these... don't they always put out data? They're like, yeah. also a data yeah. company. Yeah. Well, let me so, look it up. I know I shouldn't be, but you, uh, I mean, be careful. It's for science. Just, um, just but you do. But then you do. Remember, you do have to go to the. Yeah. They but they have a site that's safe for work. Yeah. With all the data. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I made that search right yeah. now. I'm I'm really apologizing. Should have done it incognito because then it wouldn't I, have affected you as much. I think much. I have now ruined my um, reputation on the internet. Um, let's go back. I don't to, think. I don't think. I don't think this is a porn. I device. don't think porn is is that big. That big and that unless, sphere of use as we think. I unless think, you fi think fixing big no, engines is yeah. I is think sexy. Yeah. I think people appreciate something a little more <laughs> hands on. What they're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what they're honestly. showing here, which is kind of interesting, is it's and this is the new Microsoft. Also, it's an open platform which can be used with Android and iOS. So maybe one of your engineers has mm -hmm. can afford the expensive Oculus or not Oculus uh, Hololens, 
but the other one can be using an iPad. So see, she's seeing the same imagery on the iPad in augmented reality. So that, I think that's very interesting. Suppose they're not going after classrooms with this. Well, it's expensive. They did mention education, but the the I wonder, I wonder if uh, too, right? Yeah. I wonder if that you could. I mean, if you can use this with Android, I wonder if you could do cardboard. Uh, sure. You know, Why not? Yeah, I'm sure you can. A few bucks, you can. Yeah. You know, one one person has the Hololens, and then everybody else gets. I think a that's a, that's cardboard. exactly right. There's an inexpensive uh, way to do it. That's also, VR, yeah. but you'd be able to see the Im image and uh, that they're all talking about and working on. I was also, I was going to yeah. say, I wonder if Google's tapped that market and the other companies are like. Eh. Well, see, well, this is why you Microsoft know. doesn't care if Google and Apple are it's involved true. because what they're selling really is Azure services. That's true. That's this true. is this hardware is secondary to the whole thing. It's really all about Azure, and it, that was very clear from the beginning of the event on. Is it's all about the cloud and selling services through the cloud, and weirdly, their base, all of the products that they're talking about here, uh, and here's where he's talking about open, and they have an app store, mm -hmm. but anybody else can have an app store. All the products here are under the the Microsoft. Sobriquet Dynamics 365, which until now was their CRM ERP platform, Ooh. but suddenly it's their ver augmented reality platform too. So it, they're clearly they see this as a cloud service that happens to have some hardware, but it doesn't matter if it's not their hardware. Here's Tim Sweeney, who reminded me so much of the guy. I should turn the audio on for this. In um, wait a minute. So we're starting with the Unreal Engine. Poland support is he's, up and running now. He's, and he's, coming he's, he, he's the geek in that Ready Player One, uh, what was the name of the, Ogden Morrow? He's Ogden Morrow. To all developers in May. And on HoloLens. I think, that, I think that Ogden Morrow was based. And for the long term. <laughs> So Tim Sweeney. Engine, I shouldn't knock him. The guy made $7 billion dollars yeah. to all last year on Fortnite. And, on and Fortnite and HoloLens might be interesting. Is it Ogden Morrow? Is that right? James Halliday. James Halliday. I don't know who Ogden Morrow Ogden Morrow was, was the, the business partner. Oh, was kind of, Halliday uh, was the nerdy guy. Slightly more yeah. socially adept. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. Everything you ever wanted to know and probably considerably more about HoloLens 2. Good for Microsoft. I, I'm rooting for them. Isn't that weird? They're smart. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would never have said that. And what's really interesting is I think a lot of open source developers are rooting oh, for heck Microsoft yeah. now that oh, they own GitHub yeah. and they use yes, Linux absolutely. and Windows. And absolutely. And they've got a great percentage of the gamer market as well. I mean, they're in a good spot. Simon Pegg played Ogden Morrow. Uh, who played James oh. Halliday? He was so good. A great actor. I can't remember his name, but he was wonderful. Hey, let's take a little break. You know, tonight the uh, Oscars, we're going to get out of here soon because we all want to go watch the red carpet. It's just going to be an important Oscar night to watch because the front runner on Best Picture is a movie that was not made for theaters. It was made by Netflix for Netflix. In order to get into consideration for an Oscar, Roma had to be shown in a few theaters briefly. But it was it's weird. You can see this for free if you have a Netflix subscription. And it is an amazing film. It is a, it is, I would say, a modern classic. Yeah, you got to set a time aside to watch it. And but what's going to happen if they give it an Academy Award? This it's Netflix has a an Oscar. It pisses off the entire Hollywood. What movie happens industry. when Netflix gets an EGOT? Oh yeah. Does like, Netflix have, we got, have an Emmy, a Grammy? Uh, is this and what's a Tony happening yet? now? Like streaming services want a part of the pie? I don't think they'll ever get a Tony. You can't put Netflix on Broadway. <laughs> So there might be an ego. Netflix theater. I'm just saying they have a lot of money and they want to expand to the East wow. Coast, get out of Los Gatos, you know. I think it's really... The Reed Hastings story. Say again? The Reed Hastings story. The Reed Hastings story. What's That's the, a musical. Oh, the musical. That's the musical. I got an idea. What has more bandwidth than DVDs by mail? I mean... <laughs> You'd be good. I want it. I want it. I want that job. I don't know, Leo. Leo it Laporte is like... Reed Hastings <laughs> without the wallet. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting if Netflix wins an Academy Award. This is going to set the movie industry on its ear. I'll be watching that with you. You know what? Good for them. Good because for them. Because Hollywood it's a great needs movie. some fire under its butt. And by the way, it's Alfonso Cuaron, who is a, one of our greatest directors. Every, like Children of Men. Oh my God, how many times have I seen he that did. movie? And the just best like... Harry Potter movie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Prisoner of Azkaban. Yes. He did Y Tu Mama Tambien, yes. which was an amazing indie yes. film. 
beautiful he, film. He did uh, uh, Gravity with Sandra Bullock. So he, he did. Do, that was also a great film. He do big Hollywood movies. This is a small movie, autobiographical, about his life in uh, 1970s middle class Mexico, Mexico City, mm -hmm. in the Colonia Roma, which is why mm -hmm. the name Roma. Mm -hmm. And it's about his housekeeper who raised him. And it's shot in black and white. Black and white digital, though, which I thought was interesting. She's also the first indigenous person. Uh, she's nominated to for be best nominated actress. For best actress. I don't think she'll and win best she's actress. She's never had an actor it's her first acting job. job for this. Yeah, first acting job. Mm -hmm. uh, I I do. Uh, I think this this is what's really. Of course, there's a lot of diversity in the nominees: Black Klansman mm -hmm. and Black Panther, both of which are great movies and deserve it. Green Book, uh, which is a little more controversial, but also mm -hmm. a great movie. Vigo is mm -hmm. awesome mm -hmm. in it. Um, it'll be it's an int interesting night tonight but I but the but the tech angle and the thing to watch for is what happens to mm -hmm, Roma. Mm -hmm. our show today brought to you by Atlassian and I mean brought to you by Atla we use Atlassian we're an Atlassian house so Atlassian everybody's familiar I think probably with Jira which is their agile tool which helps you plan projects figure out who's responsible see what stage the project's in it's a very satisfying tool to use when you complete a project you move it over to the completed column we love jira and jira integrates very nicely with atlassian's confluence which is what we use to document everything that's so important you could do things but you need to tell the world the other people in the department plus your stakeholders what you've done how you use it Confluence is great for that, but look how many other applications there are. There's Bitbucket if you've got code databases to maintain. There's Jira Service Desk. There's Trello. They acquired Trello. It's a fantastic project manager. They also have uh, ops solutions uh, like Ops Genie and Status Page, which will help you better detect incidents, coordinate response efforts to resolve issues faster. And of course, as always, everything integrates with Jira and Confluence so you can keep customers and stakeholders up to date. It's not just for developers. I think a lot of people think of Jira and they say, oh, it's a developer. Atlassian's a developer tool. No, no, no. Atlassian offers an affordable, reliable suite of tools for teams of all sizes, from DevOps to Agile, IT apps to Ops to ITSM and whatever's next. Atlassian is a collaboration software company that powers IT teams around the world. And we are in a world where the IT team has a lot to plan and execute. It's a very complex world. IT's at the center of it. Atlassian is at the center of any IT operation. As always, you with Atlassian, your team can choose the tools that are right for your current framework while trusting that as you grow, they will grow with you. I love Atlassian. We use it like crazy. And of course, like all of Atlassian's products, the tools you need for your IT team are easy and free to try. Just head to Atlassian.com slash IT to find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team. Atlassian is the collaboration software company that powers IT teams around the world. Try Atlassian today and see what IT can be. Atlassian.com slash IT. I think one of the biggest stories of the week, you know, maybe it's my imagination, but I think one of the biggest stories of the week is that Apple is planning to team up with Goldman Sachs to release a credit card, a credit card that will work with your iPhone. Seth, for a long time, we've been saying Apple should get in the credit card business. Is this a surprise to you? Is this a good move, you think? Um, so it's not a surprise. Um, you know, Goldman has a uh, pretty good reputation uh, among the banks. Uh, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, like, where they go with it. Because, you know, at the end, you know, this all ends up being in Apple's coffers, right? Like... Apple can team up with any bank and, you know, have a credit card, but it's all coming through the iPhone. Like, So you're wondering why something. Goldman is doing it? Yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. I wonder if it's going to be tied to investment accounts or, or you know, some other play. That's I don't really understand. Question. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand why Goldman is in it. I does don't Goldman, understand. Does Goldman do uh, credit cards? I mean, I know they're an investment banker. I don't think they do much retail stuff. Isn't that interesting? But they have the financial services, obviously, to uh, to do it, and they have the name to do it. It makes right, sense for new... Apple, which is trying to find new forms of revenue outside of selling hardware, right? This right. is one of those. Absolutely. That's how you build this service number, which is almost $10 billion a year already. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Apple knows it's got the gateway to just about everything with the phone. So they're going up and down the value chain, you know, clipping new new revenue models. So I don't think that it's surprising at all. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what angle they take um, so, here. So this is a Wall Street Journal uh, scoop from Trip Mickle, Liz Hoffman, and Peter Ruttigier. Uh, they say the card will be rolled out to employees for testing in the next few weeks, officially launched later this year. The companies hope to lure cardholders by offering them extra features on Apple's wallet app, which will let them set spending goals, track their rewards, manage their balances. Really, this could be the beginning, and may maybe this makes sense, Seth, of Apple as a bank. Yep. It's kind of what it sounds like. Cause the, you know, Apple would be the retail end of Goldman Sachs. Yep. Um, and, you know, a lot of those services that were just mentioned are available not through Apple, but through, you know, apps. Like Chase. Yeah, and you apps know, on your phone. Right. So this would be, I guess, built into your Apple account somehow or uh, directly into the phone rather than having to have a separate app. Um, I'm not sure. But well, and first, remember, people are already using like. their iPhones and their watches mm -hmm. with Apple Pay, yeah. which which has to be ultimately an important. You know, if you want to make what was that was it? I can't remember where I heard this. Maybe it was in uh, the Big Short or something. But the best way to make money is not to try to get all the money, but just to take a little piece of every transaction. And that's exactly what this is, right? If Apple's involved in every financial transaction you make. And gets a you know a few percentage points on that. That's profit. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Why uh, yeah, I mean maybe maybe it? you get a bank maybe you get a bank account with your Apple ID. You know, like every single Apple wow. customer yeah. has, you know, a Goldman account, and you know your default credit card is the Apple credit card, and you know all so these things kind of come together. I this is Goldman's first credit card, but I didn't know this in 2016. They launched an online bank, Marcus. I'd never heard of this. Marcus, which is still around. Uh, and so there's some thinking that maybe Apple, which has a loyal following among wealthy, tech-savvy young adults, could drive customers uh, to the Marcus bank. Who knows? I'm wondering if it's like uh, when you buy a car and the loan goes through the bank of the car manufacturer yeah. that they want you to have the That's right. loan through. The yeah, GMC, that actually yeah. turned out to be a bigger business for GM than than selling cars. Yeah, and they have a higher APR loans. on those things too. So you're oh, yeah. paying you're paying more to lease or buy a car through them. And I wonder if this is just a way to appeal like, hey, you're buying all this Apple stuff anyway. So why don't you just have a credit card through us and then we'll give you all these extra perks. So uh, Father Robert Ballas here, who's uh, in the chat room, Lurking. He's, he's not with us anymore. He's gone to a better place, the Rome. Vatican. <laughs> but uh, he says he's had a Marcus account uh, since its inception. How do, you, <clears throat> how do you like it, Father Robert? No fee personal loan. I'm looking at their website. No fee personal loans, high yield online savings. Wow. Okay. APR in a savings account, 2.25%. I think I'm. I think I've got a. So I think I might Start move. Start saving for that next MacBook Pro. I have an online uh, only bank. I don't. Uh, who goes to a, into a bank anymore? Mm. I use USAA, like which is a great company. Well, because they don't have branches, they you can use any ATM and they refund the ATM versus fee. me where I pay you like four dollars yeah. every time. Yeah. So I can go to any ATM, get cash out. I can deposit money checks through my phone um what else do i need to go to a bank for the cookies i don't you know they don't give them out anymore so they don't really toasters, give toasters nothing they don't give anything out anymore it's sad so no fee loans and two and a quarter percent on savings why actually, is goldman doing it uh the wall street <laughs> journal says because goldman's losing money in uh, the investment market yep that is <laughs> yeah that they're not, they're not got to diversify yeah, those bonds. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so they're both basically diversifying, right? Yeah. Essentially, they're both just like trying to get some, I don't know, some some money. Hey, from buddy, let's else. help each other get into the future. You know, I, I'm like, sure Apple would yeah. like to do this on their own. Exactly. But you don't have the cloud. The financial services are not something you just kind of waltz into. You don't just into. go from Silicon Valley to financial yeah. services. It's just it's two different worlds. Yeah. 
So uh, I could see maybe if it's a success. Apparently, Goldman's putting two hundred million dollars into uh, adding customer support call centers, building an internal system to handle payments. You know, beefing up Marcus, and uh, at, this is a major investment. Said people familiar with the matter at a time when the bank is trying to cut costs. So it's interesting. I could see Apple maybe saying, "Well, let's let's partner. If it goes well, we'll just buy you out. We'll just buy you out." He got the cash. Oof. Why not? I bet they're thinking of that. Anyway, this is something we've talked about many times on MacBreak Weekly. Is if app, you know, if Apple's going to rely on services, what it really means for Apple, since iPhone sales are down, mm -hmm. you can't count on Mac or iPad sales to buoy you up. You don't have the next big thing yet. In fact, yeah, Apple's even saying this on their on their analyst calls. It's all about services. Yep. How do you? What do you do to replace that kind of revenue, which is significant? Banking. That's why Microsoft is doing so well because they they kind of floated on those services that were yeah. working for them and Apple sees that and is thinking ahead, all right, well, there's only so much more time we have left to make money off of all this hardware. Eventually, eventually it's going to stall a little bit yeah. because everybody will have their hardware and can't, you know, can't keep upgrading. <laughs> No, just, but that's one more point, reason. To slow down. It's one more reason to buy an Apple Watch and an iPhone is because I do all my banking on it. Right. And I can't do that on my Android phone. Don't you? I bet they won't do it on an Android phone, right? No, they're going to keep it open. As long as we're talking <laughs> Apple, uh, you kind of brought this up, Seth. Apple is planning on combining. This is from Mark Gurman, who's very, very reliable at Bloomberg. Well. I think you know Mark pretty well, Seth. I, I know Mark. I've heard of him. <laughs> Seth started Mark in his uh, career when he was like 17, right, Seth? It might have been even younger. He was, he was just know, a kid. It was like, yeah, was, he's a tipster turned uh, star reporter. Yeah. I'm sure you're rooting for him, but still. Absolutely. He should be writing for 9 to 5 Mac. Of course. Not this bloom perk. Anyway, <laughs> he's kept his sources, apparently. He says Apple plans to come. This is interesting. The first thing I'd heard earlier was that Apple wants to encourage uh, iPad developers to make their apps Mac compatible. And there's an SDK. Mm -hmm. It would require re recompiling. Now Mark's saying that's this year. But going forward by 2021, Apple plans to combine iPhone, iPad, and Macintosh apps. So there's one platform. Is that your understanding of this, Seth? Well, I mean, so combine this with the news um, also this week that um, Macs are going to um, Apple chips, They're going away arm, from Intel. ARM-based, yeah. ARM-based chip, uh, chips, uh, I would assume that, you know, Apple 8, 12, 13, 14, whatever. Um, so you're kind of merging, really, the platforms at this point. So, you know, two, looking two years out, um, you kind of see that, the Mac is going to be kind of like an iOS device at that point. Okay, Project So, Asia. you know, and is, if you're that's pulling, Google's response to uh, this sorry. is that we got to make our own I just, operating it, system. It, that, that's not going to... mean interrupt, Seth. Oh, no, that's ugly. No. That's ugly at this point. Thinking... Gotta, yeah. <laughs> this is a mature. This is a mature system, ecosystem. Well, but right. it's, it's along the same lines. Yeah. yeah. So the idea yeah, is by I mean, 2021, when together. you write an app, it will work on any of those three platforms. And you're right, Seth. Key to that is putting Mac on ARM. Right. Or and, Apple's version. And, and and they're kind of like with Marzipan, they're kind of like, you know, here's our roadmap. Here's our three-year plan, you know, to get developers to write one app for both. You know, like you, you most developers are writing for iOS because there's, a, you know, to so many more people on iOS than Mac. So iOS apps will work on Mac. And then theoretically, everybody comes over except maybe like, you know, Parallels isn't going to work on mm -hmm. um uh, not Intel chips, right. and uh, you know, obviously Adobe's got a lot of work to do mm -hmm. um, to get their desktop apps. You know, the, the bigger, more complicated stuff that's got a lot of legacy um, uh, Intel code. It's going to be hard, but um, you know, this is one of those things. This is like Apple going from uh, PowerPC to Intel. Um, it's just a transition over a period of time. And uh, we kind of know, like it's not official yet, we kind of know what that looks like, um, you know, with Mark's reporting and others. Um, you know, it looks like we're about three years away from a, you know, when when it's 
fully engaged. And maybe this year, Tim Cook or somebody else kind of shows that roadmap a little bit better so that developers are really on board. This is going to benefit the rest of us as well, because I am hearing like Adobe is going to have to go in and do some work. And we have all these other well, suites. But Adobe's so working thinking, on it. They already have Photoshop's getting more and more capable. Lightroom's getting more and more capable, both on iOS. Adobe announced at uh, their last conference that they were going to make a photo, full Photoshop for iOS. Mm -hmm. um, all, truthfully, a lot of the pro apps are Apple's own apps. Final Cut, Logic. Uh, their, uh, you know, pages. And uh, so I think Apple must have been working on this for some time. Try, you know, How is it working for out for Microsoft? Because this is what I was sort of clumsily referring to before. Um, but but I, I wonder how it's working well, out for Microsoft. The history of this, you all know, the history of this is terrible. Uh, the, the idea of cross-platform apps is, a, is littered with strewn bodies. Remember Java Swing, the idea that you'd write once, <laughs> Swing would give you a... You, a quote, native UI on every platform, it was a disaster. I mean, yeah. everybody agrees. Actually, there's an interesting tie-in to this because Linus Torvalds showed his prickly side uh, this week uh, when he said, you have to be an idiot to think that ARM is going to make it in the server room. Mm. He says, because mm. developers want their software as a service applications to run the same platform they developed it on. They develop it on mm -hmm. x86. They want it mm -hmm. to run on x86. Nobody in his right mind really wants to do cross-compiling or, you know, one size fits all. You write an application for native. Right. But this could be where Linus missed the boat because if all of a sudden one of the biggest players, Apple, goes all ARM, maybe ARM servers are suddenly a very, very good idea. For software as a service and web app, progressive web apps and the other stuff. Maybe you are developing native. But I have to say, the conventional wisdom has always been you develop the best app is not the app you develop for both Android and iOS. It's the app you develop for that platform. An Apple app or an iPad app is not as good as an, you know, if it's just an iPhone app. It needs to, you need to develop specifically for that platform. How do you get around that? Hmm. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I guess what they're hoping for in the long term is that, you know, you're going to be developing on an iOS Mac um, <laughs> or an iOS desktop <laughs> device. So you're going to be developing iOS for, on iOS. Yeah. And, that, I, you know, that's got to be the idea. I, I don't know. I don't have any other like developing for Android ideas. on the Chromebook. I see the benefit. I do see the benefit for Apple. Uh, Apple does not want to be does not want to be. They've had to wait for Intel. And in fact, if you if you can criticize Apple for its slow development of a Mac Pro or new iMacs or new Mac Minis, it's because Intel just can't deliver. So they're sick of that. Qualcomm there and, and Apple are in huge fight, uh, suing each other, owing each other billions. Just you know, Apple as and Steve Jobs always said. By the way, it's his sixty fourth would be his sixty fourth birthday today. Um, mm. Steve Jobs always said, "You want to you." Make, you make the software you got to own the hardware you got to do it both and he always wanted a single source everything he hates the idea he hated the idea of going to intel and buying That's chips messy. so of course there's a benefit for apple but the question is that then but then is there a benefit for consumers you know and and are we going to be as happy i know as a mac user i'm not into i'm not looking forward to using my ipad for anything i use my mac for i've tried it's a nightmare i'm smiling because it's my life with the chromebook yeah, you're you're almost you're kind of doing that. I mean, theoretically, well, Apple has a couple couple years to bridge that gap, right. make the iPad OS more like a Mac OS. It really it was, the and great in theory, eventually it'll be awesome, right? I mean, for <laughs> the consumer, in theory, it's great. eventually everything is awesome. Yeah, exactly. In theory, everything is awesome. <laughs> but no, like I th I think about the way that I use, you know, I'm an Android, and the way that I use essentially Google Drive, Gmail, all mm -hmm. of that stuff. And it is, the experience is fundamentally the same on my uh, PC as it is on my phone, right? And this is kind of, in theory, this is what it looks like for the consumer, like across the board, no matter what mm -hmm. you're using, right? Um, and to me, that that sounds great, being able to um, I don't know, use Adobe products on my phone the same way that I do or a similar way that I do on my 
machine. I mean, so many of us are doing that all the time anyway, as as people who are working increasingly all the time, we're like right. trying to like open the thing on our phone uh, instead of our computer because our computer is not in front of us. Right. right. So in theory, it would be great to be able to have that experience. Maybe right? Apple will make a foldable iPad. Samsung's making the displays We've for them. We've gone full circle. <laughs> so. so actually, when I bought the iPad Pro, the new iPad Pro 12.9, that was exactly Giant. my experience, which is this is the best hardware. This is this is hardware from the future. This is amazing. It's The processor is a desktop class, maybe even faster processor. The screen is, it's, in every way, it was stellar hardware, and it was completely hobbled by iOS, which wasn't anywhere near as sophisticated. So they do have a, they have some work to do. Yeah, my understanding is iOS 13 this year is going to be a big step in that direction. Like I, I think 13, they're going to have a lucky number 13. It's a good number. The rumor, Seth, was that they wanted to do this in 12. Ste right. Stepped back. Uh, Scott Forstall and others said, no, let's get 12 reliable. <laughs> I don't know if Forstall is still making those calls. Maybe but, not, Scott. Yeah. In fact, it was Scott Forstall that they got rid of so that they could do this and step back and right. say, let's make it reliable. And then in 13, we'll start taking those steps towards desktop computing. Right. That's kind of what I've been hearing. So Microsoft very famously stumbled on this one, moving Windows 7 to Windows 8, trying to make a des hybrid desktop tablet. And it was a horrific failure. Apple was better. Really they didn't really try that hard. They just said, <laughs> here and here and, and let's go. Just mush them together. <laughs> for right. my Windows 8. I skipped oh, that it was one. A I nightmare. skipped it. I skipped it. I just stayed on 7 until I couldn't. And actually, 10 has solved that problem. Mm -hmm. the, the, much of the tablet interface that was in 8 has been hidden, is still in 10, but has been hidden. And so it can look like a desktop operating system, even when I you never have tablet use it. features. Never. Sometimes I touch the screen, but not always. Oh, I liked. I like touching Well, that's the why screen. I like the Chromebook because I like here touching it's touching the screen. I mean, you're actually yeah. I forgot you have this giant Windows. I have a giant Surface device. I mean, I, th I it's actually bugged the hell out of me. I would. That Apple I would does not do have this touch. too. I, I would do this too if I had this giant thing. Pat the screen. Yeah. Uh, this is a bold step by Apple, but I think it's clear Apple has to make a bold step at this point. That iPhone sales are tailing off. Uh, and that services aren't going to grow unless you start a bank, mm. <laughs> offer a credit card, and hardware is not going to grow unless you unify your bestseller iPhone with everything else. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's a it's a bold move, but I think uh, Apple could do it. Actually, I saw an article, I don't know if it's in our rundown today, saying that actually there's been a huge shakeup in Apple's executive uh, over the last year. Uh, and, of course, the most recent is uh, Angela Arendt, who was a very talented executive in charge of retail, um, leaving after only five years. Uh, yeah, and the, and the Google guy, the John Giandara, is Gian kind Andreas, of been, yeah. Giandrea has been elevated to, like, uh, you know, exec level. Um, he's obviously an important person because he's kind of the AI guy, and that's, you know, Apple's next 10 years is going to be very heavy AI. So, yeah, the, I agree with the the Wall Street Journal's take on that, that um, these new people coming in are, are quite important. They say it really shows that Apple is going all in on uh, services. But I think it really is. This is the new this is the new game plan. Where do you think this comes from, Tim Cook? He doesn't ever seem like a visionary. I don't know who's who's running this. At this point, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't see Tim Cook saying, uh, you know, I want to make more. I want to make uh, video. Like I want to make movies. Like that doesn't seem like something oh, he would. That's at EQ think. all the way, right? Right, and and like you know, I have to say, like I'm I'm a big Apple fan. I like Eddie Q's stuff. Does isn't always Apple's best stuff, and and yeah. like I have to admit it as well. Like. Every announcement that we cover that, you know, Apple's getting into this or that or whatever, I'm always like, none of it is interesting to me. Like, it's just, you know, like the app game show. Like, that was like, oh, that was terrible. Just painful. It was painful. Yeah. And so I don't know that Apple's going to be super successful in this area. I, you know, I hope, I hope 
they are. I hope there's some interesting stuff that comes out of this, but well, so far I haven't seen anything. We're expecting, at least according to John Pachkowski, I think German confirmed it, March 25th, Apple is hoping to roll out this new movie service and the new news mm -hmm. service. Uh, the Journal is also reporting that there are some hitches in that get-along, including publishers. I'm sure the Wall Street Journal is one of them. New York Times, um, certainly another one. Uh, Washington Post, maybe a third that don't like Apple's plan, which includes a 50% of the take. Uh, Ouch. What the journal's reporting, again, this is not Apple, this is rumor, is that Apple has approached magazines and newspapers saying, look, here's the deal. It's going to be 10 bucks a month. We're keeping five. We'll take the other five, we'll pull it, and whoever gets the most views will get the biggest chunk of that. We'll divide it up based on engagement. Like and, a bonus? Uh, <laughs> where's the bonus coming from? I don't know. Uh, we talked a lot about this on Mac Break Weekly, and I think the consensus was absolutely any national magazine, magazines have a hard time as it is, any national magazine will probably welcome the new eyeballs and whatever revenue that they can get out of this. They're struggling anyway. It's the local newspapers that are going to say, well, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Uh, I'm the Boston Globe. I have a big Boston audience. I'm not giving them to you, Apple. Because Apple's going to take half the revenue and they're not going to give me the names of subscribers or any information about them. Uh, maybe the national papers like the Times and the Post and the Journal, it maybe makes sense for it, but it doesn't make sense for any regional publisher. SF Chronicle? Chronicle, no. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if Apple will come back to them and offer them a better deal. I guess we'll find out March 25th. Didn't Apple get in trouble with the book, oh, the publishing the book thing? thing? Yeah. A while back, yeah, and so this that, feels like a repeat of like learn from your past. But you know, uh, <laughs> you could say that. And I remember, Apple got uh, the music industry was pissed off at Steve Jobs yeah. for ninety nine cents. They destroyed the uh, the album. But you know what? In every one, every case, Apple won, didn't they? In the long run, Apple won on all of that. Uh, and that, of course, the iTunes Store is the number one way people buy music. I can't, I can't say iBooks is the number one way people buy books. Amazon owns that. Yeah. I think this is going to be interesting. March twenty fifth. Pachowski says there won't be no hardware announcements. Well, he's hedged that a little bit since. Maybe there will. Maybe there'll be a mini. Maybe there'll be a, at least some news about Mac Pro and uh, the the king of the supply chain um, analyst says that uh, there'll be a new uh, thirty-one inch monitor, a beautiful if it, if it's true. Uh, if the rumors are true, monitor. Ming Chi Kuo says. Uh, it's what was the resolution? It was weird. Six K. Six K. Yeah. Thirty one inch. Oh. Wow. I know who's going to be buying those. <laughs> yeah. Hollywood. Presumably paired with a, a new <laughs> Mac Pro. Um, right. I, I would imagine that those are going to be announced at uh, WWDC instead, in June. In June. Yeah, that makes. Sense. Yeah, I. You know, maybe uh, an iPad makes. You know, like the iPad Minis we know are coming pretty soon. Well, and you could tie that in. You hey, now you can read your magazines and your newspapers right. on the iPad Mini. You can watch the new Oprah show on the iPad Mini. Maybe they tie it in that way. It's a media consumption. They just got to figure out how to fold it. That's the only <laughs> right. thing I have to do. So take it with you. <laughs> Does it bend? Does it bend? Will it blend? That is uh, that is uh, the motto of the day. This is uh, we're talking about all the tech news. It's great to have uh, Seth Weintraub here from nine to five, nine to five Google, nine to five Mac, electric. Are you a Tesla driver? I can't remember. I am. Yeah. I I have two now. An X and an S, an X and a three. An X and a three. Yeah, you like the three? I love it. It's a great car. It's Everybody who fun. owns it loves it, but I'm worried about the long term health of tesla a little bit i, I don't blame you uh the, the ceo is a little bit of er, erratic uh, <laughs> a little so i mean you know I, and yet somebody, a genius what's this rocket that he's about to launch the guy's a clearly bit, a I genius mean, yeah he gets stuff done just a yeah. little nutty no it's you know i just like i i worry that he's gonna go on some twitter rant get get himself uh, fired from his company and it'll be in turmoil and the stock will go down and all the employees will leave because the stock price is so low and their you know options are worth nothing. It's It just feels like they're kind of on the edge at all times. It almost feels like the, he keeps them on the edge at all times. Maybe maybe that's part of his thing. That's, but that's uh, okay. so, I mean, it, it's frustrating as, as a, a Tesla fan, Tesla owner, 
that I have to go around kind of saying, yes, I know he's insane. Like, why do we have to, you know, go through all of this? The cars are quite nice. They built themselves a really good network of chargers and a, and a uh, you know gigafactory that's building tons of batteries that are help, well, helping and, Puerto Rico and, and look Australia. At this, look at this Raptor engine, which I think just got NASA approval, right, John? Are they going to be... Uh they're going to be launching this a test when? Pretty soon, right? Yeah, I can't play the video because I have I have my browser's too smart. <laughs> I hate it when browsers are that smart. Uh, but uh, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, see, every time I click on it, <laughs> I'm using the Brave browser, which I really like. I was going to ask what you. You were know on why I use it? Because it stops auto play video. Ah. <laughs> uh... Well, but there are times when I want to play video, and there's a button I'm supposed to click, but I can never find it. Anyway, yeah, so Elon is clearly, uh, you know, SpaceX is doing great. Um, I do hear bad rumors. You tell me if this is BS, Seth, about Tesla's uh, repairs, their repair facilities, the wait time for repairs, things like that. No, that's true. Uh, you know, I've, I've had two different problems with my model three and they've, they've both taken a little bit of time. Um, and, and you, I know people if you get in a wreck you, and you need body yeah. work, forget it. It's like months. Right. Yeah. But I mean, I, know, I have a neighbor who has a Tesla and she's been driving it. For, she, like she's got a, a model three and she's been like super psyched about it. And like last month I saw the repair guy there at like at her parking spot. That's the cool thing. And they then come to you. And then last week it was a Ford. The oh, Tesla was gone. That's not good. I haven't asked her about it yet, but I was like, "Hmm, that's interesting." That's like they sent the guy, and then now the car is gone. It's so. kind of like an uh, abusive relationship, where <laughs> you you know, I promise I'll never I'll never hurt you again, and then they just keep doing it. They break mm. your heart. I don't know. I'm looking. I mean, I'm looking. There's so many now electric vehicles coming out. I'm looking at other electric vehicles because my lease runs out in July. I'm looking at other electric vehicles. Are you looking at the Kona or the Nero? We're or? probably going to get a Nero uh, for sure. Lisa wants to get a Nero. If and you then, can find them, yeah. If, quite if you hard can to, find hard them, to get. yeah. I'm trying right. to pull some strings, and then. Uh, but what I really want to get in September, Porsche comes out with its first electric vehicle, the Taycan. Yeah, that'll be a Taycan. That'll be a zero. Taken. T a y c a n. But uh, Sam Sam Abulsamid says you pronounce it. The Porsche wants you to pronounce it Taycan. Why do they always do this? I don't like having a car where I have to have instructions on how even to say the manufacturer's I mean, name. Is it Porsche? Porsche? What? And I then, say Porsche because that's how I grew. That's but it's how Porsche. I was taught. I don't know. And it's Taycan, and it's zero to sixty in maybe even under three and a half seconds. That's insane. I think <laughs> they're saying two point eight. Two point eight now. Which com so, which competes with the Falcon uh, rocket engine, the Raptor rocket engine, I believe. So you take uh, it to the track. Track is right I here. Don't take it to the track. Why not? I don't go that fast. So I have fun, insane Leo. mode on my it's so Tesla, and I stop doing it because I black out. <laughs> this is weird, yeah, though. Like the zero to sixty thing is such a weird thing no, to me. Nobody like, drives I, that. I way. get it. Nobody does it. They, I mean, they do it when you get into the car. They do it to show you how awesome it is, and that is awesome. But then nobody – you don't do it in real life unless you're getting on the highway in a super tricky situation. I'm betting – And that's the only Seth time. Does it. Like, I'm betting so. It's, a, it's an important thing to know that your car can do. Like how quickly can it accelerate? I want yeah, quick acceleration. But you need zero to 60 in 2.8 I need seconds. to be able to get on the saying. freeway. Do you need it that fast? <laughs> right, I'm so, I'm so a person in a rush. This is difference between electric cars and gas cars. So yeah. if you have a gas car and you go to zero to sixty as fast as it can go, your passengers are going to think you're insane <laughs> because it it goes to first gear. That's why I don't usually. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's true. It's Unless you have a sport but, mode. But if you're on a Tesla, you just put the you know the gas pedal on the floor and. Everybody's head goes back. Like <laughs> the coffee goes flying. <laughs> it's true. It did feel like that in your People Tesla. Throw Leo. up. No, it it does. It's, did I do that to you? Yeah, but I've also been in a Porsche. Sorry. Porsche doing that, and I had the same. Well, imagine. But it's a little combining more combining the two. It's pronounced Porsche. Okay, thank you, Ben. I'm just I'm I'm the just Romanians kidding. pronounce it Porsche, it's pronounced and that's Jaguar. how I'm pronouncing it. I'm pronouncing it like my people. <laughs> <laughs> now wait a minute. Let's get this straight. You're Romanian, not Romani. No, I'm Romanian. Romania. Okay, I want to make sure because I got I'm that Balkan. wrong. I'm Balkan. I'm 80% Balkan and like 10% Italian and 10% other stuff. Don't be Balkan. Go out and 
Get a job. <laughs> Our, I don't know what. <laughs> uh, March 2nd, the uh, Raptor engine will fly. Will it fly with a crew, John? No, there won't be people on it. There will. No. It, it, but it, they're going to do that thing where they go up in the air and then they land uh, the boosters and all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. They generally don't test new engines with crews. <laughs> no. Usually, uh, yeah. I, in the water somewhere. It seems dangerous. No, but if you're Russian, you test it with dogs. That's true. Laika. R.I.P. Doggies. Aw. They were cute. The true story of Laika is actually horrible. You know that. I know. It's just awful. What? I have a husky named Laika. Oh. She was the first dog in space, wasn't she? Yep. Laika? Her and another yeah. dog. I forgot their name. And, uh, yeah, the Russians kind of lied about what happened to Laika. Those darn ruskies. Let's take a little break. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they didn't like her. Oh! oh! I'm balking at that joke. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> it's pronounced Raymond Luxury Yacht, but it's pronounced Throat Warbler Mangrove. Just, I'm just... I'm just going to say, I don't know what that, that sounds familiar, vaguely familiar, but I don't. Our show today brought to you by Cashfly, literally brought to you by Cashfly. When you download any of our content, when you go to our website and you play back videos or audio, you're getting it from our content delivery network, Cashfly. Give your users the same seamless online experience they want, the one they get from Twit. Power your site or app with the Cashfly CDN. You'll be 30% faster than the competition. And let me tell you, we've been using Cashfly now to deliver Twit content for 10 years. And never a hiccup. No 3 a.m. calls. The, the server's down. The CDN's down. It is awesome. And I don't also, I don't have to log into my Cashfly dashboard every five minutes to find out if I'm over bandwidth. Because Cashfly works with you to, to create a plan based on your yearly usage. So peaks and bumps don't bother you. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, 30% faster than other major CDNs, a 100% SLA. That's not 5, 9, 6, 9, 10. That's 100%. And the reason is they've got servers all over the world. And that's a huge advantage because your users are getting their content from a nearby server. And if one goes down, you're still online. They never go down. Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are, no matter what device they're on. I'm not the only one. There are thousands who trust Cashfly's reliable network. LG, Microsoft, Adobe, Ars Technica. We host everything, audio and video, on Cashfly, and we've been doing that for nearly a decade. In fact, I, every time I check, I, it blows me away. It's more than a petabyte a month of data delivered to uh, our audiences via Cashfly. We wouldn't be here without it. Thank you, Cashfly. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or even daily trying to track your CDN usage because there are there are no billing spikes. There may be data spikes, but there are no billing spikes. On average, in fact, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. You think you could save 20%? Here's what we're going to do. No high-pressure sales, but we will arrange... A detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. No pressure. Uh, no salesman will call. but And it's free. But you can at least find out what Cashfly can do for you and if you could save up to 20% on your CDN bill. So here's what you do. Go to twit.cashfly.com and find out. Don't, don't, don't stay in the dark. Twit.cashfly.com. Um, do we have a promo for this week? You know, many people enjoy the, the fabulous shows on the podcast network, but miss a few here and there. So each week we like to prepare a synopsis of some of the fun things you might have missed this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. We talk about all the things that we want our smartphones to do. Yeah. And this is be an awesome smartphone. And I could run a smartphone company. Well, now you can with a game called Smartphone Tycoon. So my first phone is the Twitsung Pluscom Xenophone XS Plus <laughs> Plus. This is it's incredibly a, endearing. It's a beautiful phone. Twit Live Specials. The Galaxy Fold led off. They got a lot of attention right up front when most people are watching for the Galaxy Fold. That won't be available till April. And of course, the headline is it's almost $2,000. And Samsung called it a luxury device. Hands-on tech. 
I got to go hands-on with the new Samsung Galaxy S10, S10 Plus, and S10e at the big launch event in San Francisco. iOS Today. Today, we're going to talk about how to control your computers with your iPads and your iPhones and vice versa. This is actually a show about magic. Yeah, it really is. Anthony, you know, who's a producer of our new show, when I said we were remoting and his first thought was to tell us how he actually plays video games at his desk all day on his iPhone instead what? of working. Twit. It's free when you watch from work. Wow, I just checked the uh, Oscar feed. You should see the dress Kevin Hart is wearing. No, just kidding. I was going to say, he still has an invite after <laughs> that whole thing. Cause just, just kidding. He's Ellen DeGeneres' date. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that would be appropriate. That'd be good. Uh, YouTube's had a little trouble of late. Mm, a little. A, a little. little. A little. A little bit. Disney's pulling their ads from YouTube. Uh, quite a few companies. Yeah, it's not just Disney. <laughs> not just Disney. And it all started with a Wired UK uh, report. Whew, it was kind of creepy. About, now... <laughs> So the headline was on YouTube, a network of pedophiles mm -hmm. is hiding in plain sight. The issue is, though, there are a lot of videos on YouTube of young children. Young children swimming, dancing, doing yoga. Sometimes opening gifts, opening their opening toys, toys, showing what they bought. Sometimes uh, there might be some exposed body parts, underwear. Um, I think my sense is that these are uploaded by the kids themselves or by family members mm -hmm. completely innocently, right? Right. But what happens, I guess, man, the internet, I tell you, humans are messed up, is pedophiles find them mm -hmm. and then they share them. And in fact, in the comments, they'll put timestamps for the best juicy parts <sighs> of the video. Plus, you're seeing uh, people... Um, Kids creating new videos, responding to comments from the pedophiles. So there's this whole vicious cycle. And what's worse is their recommendation engine then recommends more of this. And it was quite a shock to Alfa Romeo, Fiat, Fortnite, Grammarly, L'Oreal, Maybelline, Peloton, SingleMuslims.com. <laughs> And other major banner, major advertisers, including Disney, that their ads were appearing on these videos in this environment. The response uh, to this Wired article, which was earlier this week, is a lot of these companies, a couple of companies said, like Grammarly said, well, we need to know more. And a few, not a few companies said, we're not advertising on YouTube. We're pulling out. Now, I'm sure YouTube will fix it. Sure. And I mean, how can they fix it? A good question. Like In fact, this has been going on for some time. YouTube apparently said, promised they would fix similar problems two years ago. It's been YouTube's policy since 2017 to disable comments on videos where users are saying inappropriate things. After it's done. Well, but if they're disabled, then they'll go away. True. But apparently it's hard to find these videos. I mean, you've got so much content. People uh, that's, that's using really the comments the problem, right? to exchange phone numbers, saying, I got more like this. Call me. WhatsApp me. This is the equivalent of the chat room back in my day when my generation was just getting on the internet and the things that we were told to be afraid of, but we didn't have a video element to it because that wasn't available to us. But it is, I find it to be on par because it's, yeah, it's like going into a chat room and engaging with someone who you have no idea who they are. Here's a, from the Wired article. An advert for Grammarly runs before a YouTube video of a young girl in a paddling pool with comments like, wish she'd show something. And oh my yummy. gosh. It's but, gross. But get this, this video, I mean, it was probably a family video uploaded for yeah, other members of the family. Exactly. It has 2.2 million views. Mm -hmm. There's there's like, uh, I think there's three really interesting things about this piece to me. Um one is that a, a lot of this stuff is programmatic advertising, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, you know these, these guys aren't buying those. No, 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 no. Yeah. And I don't blame the companies yeah. at all. But, but you would think that YouTube. So there, there has to be a technology solution there, right? So there has to be some way for YouTube 
um, to think about the way that it sells programmatic advertising, I guess, or, or maybe these companies to think about like where they are buying programmatic advertising. But also I think there's this huge problem where, and this is a problem on Facebook too, they, like this, this problem of too much content for these tech platforms to like accurately police or effectively police is a problem across platforms, right? Um, and I think that these companies actually, they need to do way more than they're doing. They need to already. take a stance. None of them are taking yes. a stance. They're yes. just like, oh, well, well, we'll just do this for these people. Yeah. We'll do this for this people. And it's frustrating as a consumer because it's like, you're letting all of this bad stuff in. This is why yeah. Twitter is suffering. This is why Facebook is suffering. Our social networks are suffering because of this, because the tech companies are not taking a stance. How yeah. important are When their comments? answer is, we'll tweak the algorithm. That's sure, like, because sorry, the algorithm guys, you need to do better. Well, right. but this is what Google and Facebook and others do. They blame the algorithm. Yeah. But the algorithm is programmed by people. Yeah. It is yeah. is fed in by people. And if you have people who are not thinking about these things in the giant scope, like why are we not having sociologists work on these on these tech things to talk about sure. what what might be what might become of these technologies like we're not looking at these from a societal scope we're doing the facebook move fast and break things thing which yep. and things are breaking and you know when i was overseas over the holiday visiting my family in romania i had to keep reminding them like they haven't gotten the full news of how bad youtube is just yet the way that i have being in silicon valley like knowing what's going on here it's hard to say don't leave the kid with YouTube all day on the phone because they're, the algorithm is going to let you down and your kid is going to see something that is bad, whether it is commentary from other people, whether they are videos that, I mean, surely you've all heard of the weird videos that are being sliced together. Um, it's There's Crazy a lot of- Programmatic videos for kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's just like, it's some really creepy, dangerous stuff. I can't blame YouTube that much though. I mean, the, how many hours of video are uploaded every second? Uh, I don't know if there's any- We can't blame them, them, but they have to, I mean, you have to think about this when you're creating. I mean, if it's an issue, you need to fix it. So it's, it's certainly there at this point- <laughs> They have YouTube's attention. Uh, Disney is also reportedly pulled out, according uh, to and the Verge. That, lose that money. That's a lot of money. Money talks in this society. So, do these brands so, come back? I mean, I mean, YouTube deleted 400 accounts. They've deleted millions of comments. Do these brands come back? I'm sure they come back. Yeah, you can't not be on YouTube. Yeah, but so YouTube's got a fundamental problem where they they have an algorithm. And it's not catching this stuff. So they make the algorithm smarter or they make it tighter and maybe they get more false. You know, they pull some normal stuff out of, of the comments accidentally. But the the, the bad folks are, are going to figure it out and they're going to get worse. And it's going to be cat and mouse. And I think YouTube has to kind of change their policy. And I think, and this kind of goes for Facebook and Twitter as well, that they have to kind of tie the identity of the commenter to a real person if this is ever going to go away and, you know, have some sort of like responsibility. Like if this person is posting pedophilia stuff, you can go to his, you know, you know, who he is. You yeah. Can you know call who his he police. is. He's publicly shamed Try and all, IP. you know, all this stuff. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to change until that happens. You know, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube all know that they would lose a lot of engagement if they did that. Which means um, money. anonymous commenters are a large part of, these platforms, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this doesn't end until that happens. But what that does is it emphasizes that engagement is phony, right? Because if you're going to lose engagement, if you acquire real names, then this isn't real engagement. I understand. I mean, there, I mean, there are people behind that, a lot of this, you know, obviously some of it's bots, but there are you know, sick, demented people, but they're, you know, they still buy like yogurt and they still buy, you know, <laughs> shaving cream or whatever. So like they're still there. It's real engagement. It's just, you don't know who the, the person is. Yeah. And then you would think like Google, like, Hey, we're building this huge like dossier on this person. You can sell them much better ads if they sign in to their YouTube account and, and comment that way. You would think that would be a, a motivation for them. But I think for them, it's just draw 
numbers and raw yeah. uh, people. Comments have always been bad on YouTube. Why don't you just end commenting? Is commenting important to YouTube's revenue? No. I would imagine I would imagine if they could and not see a, a revenue hit, they probably would have by now. Yeah, okay. that's fair. That's true. Yeah, engagement is and the commenting is engagement. Exactly. Right? So. It lowers that bounce rate. But won't yeah. I, I think YouTube should think about it because honestly, I, I think people who watch videos on YouTube, I watch my twenty two year old son. He does, commenting is not important to him. He never reads the comments, doesn't leave comments. He watches the videos. The recommendation system is important. That's another problem YouTube's got to solve. You raised him right, Leo. You <laughs> raised him right. He's not a commenter. Gosh, <laughs> darn it. I don't even no, think I don't think a, Gen Z is very much no, into commenting. I accounts, Yeah, it's us millennials. Facebook. We're still keeping that on. Yeah. But as soon as we're done, Gen Z is done with our stuff. Thank God. I have a lot of faith in Gen Z. I blame you. Actually, I blame, is, I mean, I blame the baby boomers, of which I'm one. And then Gen X didn't care at all. Gen X was just a nullity. None of, none of you and cared. then you guys screwed it all up. We did. We did. <laughs> well, to be fair, we inherited a lot of, you know. Oh, yeah, things. sure. We built a beautiful internet for you, and look what you did. <laughs> but Gen Z is fixing it with apps like TikTok. They're fixing it with indifference <laughs> is how they're fixing it. Uh, all right. Uh, this was, the, I, I also like, I thought the the anti-vaxxer story that was the same kind issue, of, right? Yeah. Same issue, but, but interesting to see how YouTube responded there. They where, demonetized the anti-vax channels. They said, well, we're not going right. to kick you off, but we won't let you make money. <laughs> but they also did that like weird thing where they like, they like linked Wikipedia, like, T talking points from like pro vax like pr essentially pr I guess you would call it pro vax or normal talking points <laughs> below the uh, no offense to any anti vaxxers listening no 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 offend uh, them to, because what they're doing is hurting communities of people because people are traveling without being vaccinated say, and introducing what's it. all what's the problem fair, with measles fair. I had measles as a kid measles before uh, they didn't even have a vaccine when I was a kid everybody well, got yeah, it. I, I think it's boy. I think it's all the kids that die. Oh, the that, kids that the what was yeah. that happening before? Were kids dying from measles in my generation? I guess they were. I didn't yep. enjoy the They're measles. They're still dying in low income areas. Yeah, um, that don't well, have but, money. But, for but what's things. crazy though is YouTube is like instead of to me, it's still a little bit weird, right? That their response is okay, demonetize the channel. Okay, fine, but also just like link to a talking like link to a Wikipedia That's kind of what article Facebook does below too, the right? video. Yeah, it's kind of like can't you do something? You could do something a little better than that, right? I mean, do they not want to boot them off? Is that too yeah, revenue? Because you still yeah, get revenue definitely. from all those views and all those engagements. But, you know, as long as yeah. we tell you how to engage. Yeah. Kevin Roos actually wrote a great piece in the New York Times exactly along this YouTube unleashed a conspiracy theory boom. Uh -huh, yep. Great headline. In fact, I saw a stat that said almost all the current flat earthers, believe it or not, there still are flat earthers. People believe the earth is flat. Almost all of them got it from YouTube. Like they watched videos on YouTube and they, I guess that was it. They convinced them. Uh, he says the problem with YouTube, they can't, this is, it's revenue. They are not incented. He talks about a wild video from a YouTube star called Shane Dawson. He did a 104 minute documentary called Conspiracy Theories with Shane Dawson. Shane Dawson sounds familiar. Uh, he talks in the, among the conspiracy theories iPhones secretly record everything you say. Popular children's TV shows contain subliminal messages urging children to commit suicide. That yep. the deadly wire fires in California were set by the military using a high-powered laser calling a direct energy weapon. Of course, these are all made up. I don't know if Dawson was joking around, but the video has drawn more than 30 million views yeah that's Jeez. real that's Among real other things he created a uh, meme that chuck e cheese <laughs> recycles uneaten pizza slices into new pizzas and chuck e cheese was compelled to actually deny it i mean it's bad but it's not that bad like <laughs> i was gonna say in fairness that sounds like a good idea <laughs> i mean waste not water. exactly detail. don't waste food <laughs> He has 20 also, million pizza subscribers. Also, the next day is better. I agree. <laughs> and by the way, in contrast to what you said, yes. most of his subscribers are teenagers, are millennials. Mm. 
And no, he's... that's Gen Z. Oh. Gen Z, yeah. Gen Z is anybody born in 2000 on. Oh, it's the millennials that are okay. Not okay. Anyway. No, we're the ones who's... I don't understand. Nobody, nobody's in good shape. <laughs> I mean, we're yeah, screwed. we're all doomed. I mean, the earth is doomed. gone in 12 years. So... Uh, so I guess he, I don't know if he's serious or not. I guess it doesn't really matter. People believe him. Well, it's all about the pages, really. Yeah. Um, That's all you need in this world to be validated is page views. So I think I need more page views. Roos writes, innocent or not, Mr. Dawson's videos contain precisely the type of viral misinformation mm -hmm. that YouTube now says it wants to limit. And its effort raises an uncomfortable question. What if stemming the tide of misinformation on YouTube means punishing some of the platform's biggest stars? Mm. Then it becomes a big... The problem is it's ideologies and ideologies when you start going after that, it gets, ugh, it gets really dicey there. That's I mean, when there's a big, big difference between Pizza Gate and Chuck E. Cheese assembling pizzas from used... True. That... There's a big difference between Infowars saying Sandy Hook didn't happen mm -hmm. and Shane yes. Dawson saying the moon landing didn't happen. But, uh, you know, they there's a continuum and they're both on that continuum somewhere. But it is dicey. I, I mean, I think, you know, Flo is right, right? I mean, it, it does get really dicey when... when and, and that's why these companies don't want to do it, right? Is Is... They, they're the where they're coming from is like, oh, we don't want to make decisions about free speech, right? right. Like we, we, we don't want to we don't decide want. that one thing is is dangerous and the other thing is well, not. I don't want to take sides. And one in of this the threats, yeah, and that's how they sidestep it. One right? of the threats, yes. of course, exactly. is regulation, government regulation, and that's something that nobody w wants. But maybe they want some limited government regulation. They don't want all the states. But the, the truth is I'm not I wouldn't worry about government regulation because that's the other seamy side of this is that the the government is hand in hand with these companies because they provide them with valuable surveillance information and which the governments want. So it seems to me they're they're unlikely to enforce privacy and other restrictions on these companies because yeah. it's an unholy alliance. Yeah. Yep. What happens when, like, uh, imagine a scenario where where YouTube is actually owned by Microsoft, which has the military contract, not to make a conspiracy video, but like, I, I, you know, this stuff gets really dicey really fast. Well, Google did have that thing they were working on. Yeah, but learning, Google, but... Google, after the employees revolted, said, all right, we're not going to do Project Jedi. Microsoft snapped it up. Because it's a ten billion dollar Defense Department contract, money talks. Yeah. But as I said, uh, when did it become unpatriotic to create products for the Defense Department? I mean, the, the whole sure. internet came from the Defense Department. But it's well, it's unpatriotic because what happened is that the uh, we the, everything you're looking at. I mean, <laughs> the whole internet, the way this comes to you, it's unpatriotic. All of it was funded by the Department of Defense. Yes, but it's unpatriotic to go out and ruin other. Well, you don't want to kill people with <laughs> exactly. Your it's that's not patriotic either. That's that's yeah. just. How about this one? We, we, Wall Street Journal is on a tear. Some people say that the reason the Wall Street Journal is so quick to castigate Google and Facebook is because they're the biggest threats to the Wall Street Journal's business model. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I think this is very good reporting. This is uh, Sham, Sam Schechner. You give apps sensitive personal information, they tell Facebook. We all know that the Facebook app on your phone is spying on you. But did you know that millions of smartphone users are confessing intimate secrets to apps, which then turn around and send it on to Facebook? Here's a, a face, an app called Flow. I'm sorry. Period and ovulation tracker. Oh, yeah. This is actually a very popular app amongst my friends. Group. Right. If you're trying to get pregnant, you would yeah. use this. You would enter the I actually the have a lot of, of friends who are period, trying to right? get pregnant yep. right now using this app. So they enter in this personal data, which is immediately sent to Facebook. That's awful because that is even, extremely personal data. Even if you don't have a Facebook account. That's, that's the data of your ovulation that's like incredibly personal to your right. cycle. That is not something that I want to have be monetized, especially if that person ends up not getting pregnant and they've been trying so hard. And then that stuff is used to sell you stuff. It's just such a, 
it's an awful thing. <laughs> it's just so It's ouch. pretty bad. It's bad. It's pretty bad. So yeah. Uh, here's the steps according to the Wall Street Journal. A user opens Flow, logs when she had her last period. Then Facebook software inside Flow. I don't I don't know what software they're using, but Facebook software inside Flow records that action, sends a custom app event Is to Flow Facebook. Is Flow built on Facebook's Might be React. React, that's Might what I'm React. thinking. I don't know. It includes data about the user's device as well as, well as other data Flow defines, such as the fact that the user may be ovulating. Right. Then Facebook can often match that data with actual Facebook users. Facebook lets developers use their own custom events to target ads at their users. That's so awful because if that person can't conceive, they're just being reminded, no, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I'm, I'm also feeling very, because I do have friends who are, again, trying and using Flo, this app. Flow has 25 million active users. So you um, log on to Facebook and it tells you, buy diapers for the baby right. that you've been struggling oh, to conceive. I see you're ovulating. Yeah. Um, buy these ovula ovulation test kits, maybe. Like, that's a thing right. they would try and sell you, which it's, it's just... Ugh. So <laughs> Facebook... Or uh, congratulations, you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah. You know. it's well, like, remember that article? This was some years ago, and it seemed like science fiction at the time that Target knew somebody was pregnant before her family did. Right. Because of yeah, her yeah. shopping patterns. Facebook said some of the data sharing uncovered by the journal's testing appeared to violate its business terms, which instruct app developers not to send it health, financial information, or other categories of sensitive information. So there, this is so, this is so playbook, Facebook playbook. Oh, it's doing that? Oh, that we never, that's sorry. We're going to fix that right now. Like, that's how Facebook works. Facebook says it's telling apps to stop sending information. And it may take additional action if the apps. Well, don't I also apply. want to talk to the developers of Flow because I want to know why this is in the back end of the app. So they can sell ads. So that's a monetization strategy. Yeah. It's a it's a more complicated one than just putting ads in Flow. Instead, they're going to put ads on your Facebook page based on stuff you told. I would Flow. rather have an ad in Flow that is just like, "Hey, go buy these test strips or something." You know, <laughs> have it be localized. Or something. It probably also uh, violates Apple's privacy policies if it's on an iPhone. I would rather pay for an app so it doesn't do any of that. In fact, a lot of the apps now that I use on my Android phone, I, I would rather pay for the data to just stay local, back up and restore on my Dropbox, and uh, I'll give you $3 a month. And just don't, just give it to you. Just give you the money to use your app. Just stop sending my data places. Um, anyway, just to be aware. I mean, yeah. I think it, if you want privacy, use an iPhone and don't, whatever you do, install anything on it. Just don't exist. <laughs> That's it. I mean, if you want just... privacy, don't exist. Your car is tracking you. Your house is tracking you. Know you know what's not tracking you? My Casper mattress oh. has no electronics whatsoever. It's a respite. It cannot, it's a respite. It's a place to go where you are safe from prying eyes and a great night's sleep is one of life's greatest luxuries isn't it i mean honestly how much would you pay for a great night's sleep well if you go to the mattress store around the corner you're paying way way too much actually this is how casper got started casper's founders as as with any smart startup they were looking for inefficiencies in the marketplace and the biggest inefficiency of all is the mattress business mattress manufacturers sell their mattresses to mattress stores which then mark them up 100 percent and more so that you can come in and buy it from them. That's why mattresses are ridiculously expensive. Casper said, wait a minute. We can make our great mattresses in the United States. We can engineer them to really be perfect and just sell them direct to customers and we would be able to cut the price significantly. You know, no reseller, no showroom. We'll just pass the savings on to you. But then there's a problem because we think, and this is the message I want to get out, we think that, that you should go to a showroom and lie on a mattress before you buy it. But in fact, that is not the way to test a mattress. I've done it many times and always buy the wrong mattress. It feels different in the showroom somehow. You are fully clothed. It's broad daylight and there's some salesperson looking down her nose at you. You can't really enjoy it. So what Casper does is they give you, I love this, 100 days in your house, in a real environment. If at any time in the first 100 days you say, this isn't the mattress for me, you call them up. They will come. They will get it. They will fund you every penny. No trouble. I have the original Casper mattress. It combines multiple supportive memory foams 
for a sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. It's kind of magical. It's firm but soft. I, you know, it's hard to describe. You got to try it, and it's breathable. This is so important. Sleeping cool is really important to a good night's sleep. The Casper mattress breathes, so you can regulate your temperature throughout the night. Long-lasting comfort and support with an obsessively engineered mattress for an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience. I think you'll love Casper. They uphold the highest environmental production standards. They're made in the United States. They come in a surprisingly compact box. You open it up, shh, there's the mattress. It smells great. You don't have to air it out. I, I remember buying a mattress from a big company a few years ago, and you have to air it out for three days because it smells so bad. Not the Casper. We slept on it immediately that night. In fact, here's the Casper. This is a queen in a box that you could easily, you know, heft up the stairs yourself. I sent my son in college uh, when he first started to sleep in the dorms. He said, this is a disgusting mattress. We sent him a Casper mattress, a twin, and he was able to bring it upstairs. And it was so affordable that after four years, he said, what do I do with the mattress? I said, eh, leave it there. The next guy will appreciate a nice mattress. You're going to love your Casper. Free shipping and, yes... If you don't like it, free returns in the U.S. and Canada. You will like it, I know. Get a Casper mattress today. You can save $50 towards select mattresses by going to casper.com slash twit. Use the promo code twit at checkout. That's casper.com slash twit. Promo code twit. Save $50 on select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply. We thank Casper for their support. Actually, the U.K. is looking into a Facebook they, they issued a scathing report. Parliament, uh, the, a British parliamentary committee, which spent months last year investigating online political disinformation, singled out Facebook for disingenuous and bad faith responses to democratic concerns about the misuse of people's data. The committee called for Facebook's use of user data to be investigated by the UK data watchdog. In fact... The uh, Information Commissioner's Office suggested Facebook needs to change its business model, warning the company risks burning user trust for good. <laughs> that is a risk, isn't it? The ICO also called for an ethical pause of social media ads for election campaigning. So maybe in the UK, Facebook's going to get its comeuppance. Remember, Mark Zuckerberg refused to go and testify to Parliament, although he is happy, apparently, to meet behind the scenes. <laughs> with uh, various government officials. It's less stressful for him. He doesn't sweat as much or have to prepare yes. as much with a yes. press, press uh, person. Facebook has killed the Onavo app. So this was the app they got in trouble with Apple. Apple banned it. Then they uh. took the code from the Onava app, put it in a different app, which they continue to use. Um, Facebook does did until recently continue to make it available on android because android doesn't have the same controls on the app store yeah and uh confidential emails according to computer weekly show that facebook planned to use its android app to track the location of its customers and to allow advertisers to send political advertising and invites to dating sites to people they thought were single this is a confidential uh, documents that were Seen by Computer Weekly also reveal plans by Facebook to pass data on single Facebook users to companies selling data services. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> the, the documents marked confidential revealed a secret program by Facebook's growth team. There it is, that growth team again, to collect and exploit data from customers with Android mobile phones. This comes only a week after that UK parliamentary uh, report. Love to be exploited because wow. of my phone. <laughs> Do you all still use Facebook in the light of all this? No? I deactivated mine last year and mm -hmm. it's been great. I don't I, miss uh, it. I've gotten back to texting my friends one-on-one -on -one. Um, throughout the week. I try to just put it into my schedule, say, ho, oh, I have I'm taking a five-minute break. Let me check in with a friend. And I have to say my relationships have increased. Maybe. Since I've left Facebook, they've Maybe. actually gotten a lot better and a lot healthier yeah. because we are forced to communicate with each other to make that connection. And it's great for us. It makes me feel more whole as a person, honestly. In our chat room, Mandy the Clown says, why isn't there just a program on Twit called This Week and How Facebook Screws You? And then... Uh, <laughs> it's a new show idea, Leo. I mean, there's plenty of content it. there. <laughs> Cousin of Jaw says, no, nah, it'd be too, way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you need a marathoner host for that Seth, one. Seth, do you still use Facebook? 
Yeah, so um, I do. Uh, I don't. I've never used it like I think most people use it or used to use it. Um, I use it to send pictures of my kids yeah. privately to my parents and other people who think Facebook is the internet. And then um, all the sites obviously have to, you know, use Facebook to. It's kind of like a feed. So you know, when Nine to Five Mac publishes right. a new story, it goes to Facebook. I have. Does, you know, is, that, does I, Facebook is, drive a lot of traffic for for your Nine to Five publications in Electric? Is not, that an important? Not, not a ton. Um, it, but it's one of the, you know, Twitter and the others that it's there. It's always going to probably be there. So we do, I mean, it, we're not sharing any of our user data. If people choose to, to look at Facebook and they choose to follow us, then they get, you know, some of our stories in their feed. Although Facebook more recently has been, and this is of course, Facebook being Facebook, they want us to pay them so that people who follow us can see our stories. So that's that's one of those things where I'm like, uh, you know. What? Oh, yeah, I get that all the time. You know, you'd get a lot more viewers on this if you just give us some money. Right. Or, so, your, or your viewers would actually view this if you just give well, us some money? Well, yes. Isn't right. it more like that? No, yes. It would be nice if somebody saw this post. It's like paying right. again to get to the wait list. <laughs> yeah. Because the algorithm Ooh. deprecates publications, right? This is the new thing that Facebook's doing. It's it's prioritizing local and personal over national publications. Yeah, which hurt a lot of people. It's like they come into the, your grocery store and they like break some milk bottles. Yeah, be a shame. They're like, oh, if be a shame would if all your milk if your milk was all broken, <laughs> wouldn't it? Do you? And then they walk out. That, I mean, honestly, when when does it flip on Facebook where everybody just goes, "Wow, these guys are horrible." I think it. I think it is happening right now. I mean, you you guys don't use Facebook anymore. Um, you know, I feel kind of. I want to say guilty putting stuff on Facebook. Um, well, that's different. I mean, you know what? Twit has a Facebook page, and we put stuff there. As a publication, yeah, I mean, you got to be where your people, your viewers, or listeners, or readers are. Right. I don't. I'm not so, on Twitter either, but we have a Twit feed on Twitter. Right. You're not on Twitter. No, I gave up on Twitter. Twitter's a dumpster fire. It is. It is. And everybody, when I say that, everybody says, <laughs> but oh, it's no. it's my dumpster yeah, fire. Right. <laughs> oh, no, Leo, you can, you can have, just, you're not following the right people. Just follow nice people and you'll get a nice feed. But what they don't think about is when you're a public figure, your at replies are full of crap. And yeah. so, I mean, I don't look at at replies, but still, I don't want to be there. I, Twitter has done, as far as I could tell, zero to try to improve this environment. Jack don't care. Jack, Jack, Jack by the way, Ev, Ev done gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ev left this week. He's off the board. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They should put me on the board. Founder of Twitter, Ev Williams, is uh, now not, nothing. He sold as much of his stake. And Ben, are you going to work ben, on do, that, do you that use, medium? He's, my medium's his thing now, right? Uh, ben, do you use uh, Twitter or Facebook? Are you a social media hound? I, 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 well, you know, I make a podcast about Reddit, so, uh, oh, I, I love Reddit. I use a That's lot different. of Reddit. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, but I do, I use Twitter. I don't use Facebook really. I'm funny? still on Facebook, but it's like one of those things where like I log in and I see a billion notifications <sighs> and I'm like, ah, but it, it's a great, it's a great white pages. I'm just yeah. saying. It is. It's a great white page. I do That's miss the true. ability to stalk people and find out more about them yeah. and see family pictures of them. It's true. Because uh, yeah. I meet somebody, I say, Gee, I used to, I'd go to their Facebook page and I'd know, I'd know more about them than their aunts. I was going to say now Instagram, <laughs> the new thing I also is, left Instagram. I don't trust them. I either. know. I Well, at Instagram now, because I'm trying to follow along with folks and their kids, you know, you don't see those folks as often. So they have private accounts now. Uh, that's a good way to do it. And that's so, what Lisa does. Yeah, and, and, yeah. I, and I think that that's that is a okay. good that is a good middle ground and also WhatsApp which is another Facebook property but that is where I put my family network so that my but family and I have a thread with each other constantly. Now in light of all these things you know that Facebook's doing with apps you know but any Facebook app including Instagram yeah. and WhatsApp that's on your phone is spying on you. But the it? problem is yeah. that it's hard to get people to move away from it. Like right. that's that's the problem is people don't know yeah. that Instagram is owned by Facebook. Yeah, they don't. My mom Many does. Oh, my mom my that. mom is very well informed about this stuff and she's still There's a certain yeah. irony in me saying I love Reddit when Reddit is absolutely a cesspool too. It's just that I don't go anywhere 
that I see that. Yeah, I have a nice little community on Reddit. I follow the the Animal fountain. Crossing people. Yeah, I follow, very... follow the Fountain Pen subreddit. You know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, when you go to those small little communities away from the bad stuff. Yeah, yeah, I just don't go near it. Uh, yeah. I don't know how that's different from Twitter, except that I just I can't escape stuff aimed at me on Twitter. Nobody aims yeah. anything at me on Reddit because I lurk. I it's think. hard for I've a lot of my gal pals are leaving Twitter because it's just like it's unsafe to be a woman journalist. Is, on that's Twitter. actually a lot of the reason. Yeah. It's not for me. It's because all the women I know are absolutely horrifically abused on Twitter, and Twitter it's does like, nothing about yeah, it. It, and just, it infuriates me. So it's really more of a. I'm taking a stand that yeah. I really can't use Twitter. Matt, people Mastodon. Mastodon is like... I tried it. There's nothing I know. going on. It's that, I know. It's, I, I feel like social media, because of all this stuff that we've talked about on this show, about like advertising and the way things are being monetized, I feel like the new, the new way to kind of think about social media is how can I curate it to keep it yeah. more personal yeah. and to keep it more in my network. There's value in it. Yeah, Absolutely. I have value in it as a yeah. journalist, as also a somewhat public facing figure. Like I am still trying to interact with the public on some way, but I want to be in control of all that. I want to be able to say, I want to, yeah. when I say stop, I want it to stop, you know? The nerdiest yeah. post I've ever read, mm -hmm. Stephen Wolfram, the brilliant mathematician programmer in his blog, Sinking the productive life, some details on my personal infrastructure. Nice. If you have not read this yet. <laughs> the headline, he, though. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, he never leaves the house. Well, if he does because he found out, uh, uh, you know, because he does a lot of metrics, that his mood was better when he walked around. So right. he's created a special tray for him to use when he's walking outside because apparently the guy ca cannot not be on a screen. So this is the funniest. I love, I love this blog post. And of course, this guy is an absolute genius. So I, uh, I, I don't want to knock him. But if you want to read something <laughs> just insane, uh, for 28 years, he's run the Wolfram Company from this room. He never leaves. This nope. man is my hero. This man, <laughs> no, this is what I aspire to be. He's incredibly productive. In all productive. actuality, because he's productive and he is keeping his social relationships that are important to him to continue to be creative. Here's an example. He's had the same big wooden desk for 25 years. And one of the things he realized was a bad problem in his life was flat surfaces. You put stuff on there, it piles up. So, But on the other hand, he needs flat surfaces to eat lunch. Uh -huh. yeah. So he has a pullout lunch tray oh my gosh. that he eats and then he puts it back. Oh, I love this. <laughs> I want a desk with this because I eat at my desk and I never have anywhere to eat my food. He says, I don't deal with paper much, but when something comes across my desk, I like to file it. So I have a slot <gasps> and uh, there's a banker box underneath that and he loads it up when the box gets full. He, he fills it up every couple of this months. This man is a genius. He puts it in the basement where it's going to This man sit. is a genius. I... <laughs> this is how I have structured Leo. This guy and I live very similar lives, by you, the way. You got, you got to, you got to read this. I just, I all mentioned these photos this. were taken with the Nokia Spider iPhone too. Right? I bet they were. <laughs> I bet they were. Here's his dongles. What the hell is that phone? If 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 Stephen Wolfram is using that phone, then I am seriously doing something wrong. Is that a sat phone? It looks. Oh, maybe it's a sat phone. It works everywhere. <gasps> It, works it looks like a Nokia candy everywhere. bar phone, but you're right. It works everywhere. That's the point. He see, I see he has an iPhone in there or something. Yeah. You got to have it in this day and age. It, it apparently puts everything in these plastic envelopes. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, I love it. I love it. He con married his uh, work life. Yeah. Really, when you think about it. This is the weirdest <laughs> thing. Um, apparently he gets car sick. So he really likes, to, he doesn't like to be off his laptop, but he gets car sick when he's being driven. He wants to use his computer. So he found these weird looking glasses. And which, despite being a bit odd, he says, and believe me, they are, do seem to prevent car sickness at least mm. much of the time. I so it's going to be so sick. weird when this guy pulls off the mask and it's Marie Kondo. <laughs> <laughs> Blog.stevenwolfram.com. It's just I a great this. read. And, it, and, and it's, you know, he says, I, I felt I should finally document my personal I love this, but this is how I think about, yeah. I mean, our whole work life is moving to be at home. We want to be more comfortable when we're working. It really helps us become, look, productivity is the whole reason this world is going, right? So we want to be more productive. How to be more productive while also being happy, taking our lives into our own hands. I love this. 
This man has lived my dream. This is what I try to do to my office. Every is, week I try to improve it in these kind of ways. It, he talks about how a file system should be created. I have a file system at home. <laughs> oh, this is you. It's much more brightly colored, but I have a file system. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, <laughs> I am going to wrap things, things up with a wonderful uh, Twitter post. And I want you to see the whole animation. If you're not watching, I'm sorry, you'll have to visit it. It's in the slash r slash Europe blog. The top 15 best global brands ranking. Okay. It's a it's a video. Now, I'm, uh, let me start it from the beginning because I think you really want to see this from the beginning. It starts in uh, the year 2000. Coca-Cola is, of course, the best-known brand, followed by Microsoft and IBM, GE, Nokia. But watch over time. I found this fascinating. As here we are in 2003, okay. new brands. So a couple of new brands are going to appear, and suddenly rise to the top all right and i think you could probably guess what they are disney mcdonald toyota's there mercedes benz american express 2007 Marlboro, 2008. we're coming sinking. to the crash this Marlboro the crash. has disappeared wait wait whoa google just oh oh, oh wow cow. look at that google just entered the fray and it's whoa jumping up. whoa whoa it's now number four number four position number <laughs> number three position and then all of a sudden here comes apple apple's coming on strong it looks like it's google it's microsoft <laughs> it's ibm it's apple it's apple in the lead apple number one wow apple. <laughs> isn't that a hysterical horse race that's amazing and then all the other brands shrink this is the world this is the world apple now it's longer and longer and longer and longer isn't that a isn't that a fantastic graph i just love that this is how we have to start thinking about the world Look how much has changed in yeah. just those 10 years since yep. the, the crash. I feel like the crash kind of helped make that ha happen because it but, slowed down the rest of the world so that tech and tech still had money at that point. the crash hit tech harder than anything yeah. else, That's right? true. I I don't know. I just got out of college at that time, so I was kind of- you, you remember know, it. I was yeah. busy looking for a job. <laughs> Not a good time to look for a job. I was very lucky. You went to work at pets.com? No, I went to work for Future. Oh, Future? Yeah. What happened the to Future? magazine. Well, they're now unionized. <laughs> they're the past. No, the writers have now unionized, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, just this past week. Is it online? Uh, like Bloomberg, not Bloomberg, um, who just unified, un oh, BuzzFeed. Yeah. Just unionized. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Like I said, I'm SAG AFTRA, proud of it. Yeah. I wish I could be, because then I would have Andrea Zuckerman as my president, oh. Gabrielle Carteris. I don't know who you're you talking know, about. She was Andrea Zuckerman on 90210. I don't even know my own. She president. was the smart. She was the smart, the smart one on the one? show. Good. She, she was also pro union on the show, by the way. Oh, that's good. So. Florence Zion, you'll catch her. Oh, that flow on the Twitter. And she's, of course, on All About Android. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of Android talk yes. by Tuesday. There should, we should know. And I did all. an episode of Hands on Tech this week oh, for yeah, the Galaxy S10. Nice. So go check that out because. The first review. We got the first review on the air. Nice. Hands on. Hands, I went hands on. on with it. I touched it. I ordered. Uh, <laughs> I am a nut because yeah. you could pre-order it. I pre-ordered it. And, you know, they're talking about, well, there's the S10e. That's the value one. There's the S10. That's Value. Kind of it's still $800, but yeah. yes. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, $799 and uh, $899, you get a 10e. And if you really want, you get a bigger screen, the 10 plus, or <laughs> that's 1000 But you could start to add things. For instance, they have two models with ceramic backs. Mm -hmm. I always wanted a ceramic phone. I always thought that would be the material. So I had to order that, and then it turns out you can't get the ceramic back in anything less than 512 gigs of storage for a phone. Then I thought, well, as long as I'm spending $1,250, I might as well spend $1,500 and get a terabyte of storage. <laughs> Why not? But, and 12 but now you're at the fold. And I'm practically fold priced at this point. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's true. I thought, well... I'll get the top of the line, and then we can review the other ones. You guys can get the cheap phones. I'll get the. It's nice to be the boss, isn't it, Seth? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's great to have you, Seth Weintraub. Electric is the electric car magazine. Nine to five Mac, nine to five Google. He's a legend in the publishing business. L L Seth J. <laughs> On the Twitter, I get it. L L Seth J. Thank you, Seth. Always a pleasure. Have a wonderful Ladies love evening. Seth J. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, ladies just... love Seth J. <laughs> it's it's, it's Seth an old. It's, it's is that an where old. Is LL Cool J eight. is ladies love Cool J? What's the oh, J yeah. stand for? I don't want to know. No, I think it's his name. I think it's his first name. Yeah. Ladies love Cool J. Ladies love Seth J. Ben Brock Johnson. 
No, I don't know what to say. You're wonderful. Thank you for joining us, senior producer WBUR. What's the podcast you're doing? I know you must be doing a podcast. Yeah, I make a, a podcast about Reddit called Endless Thread. Love um, it. Love it. Got Love it. Lots, lots, lots of episodes. We're uh, we're doing some investigative reporting right now, so we're on break. Um, but oh, we're looking into anti vaxxers actually. Oh, so how I shall listen prescient. to that. We'll have a, a series about that coming out in a couple months. Uh, you know, wherever you get your podcasts, <laughs> as they say, wbur.org slash endless thread. Nice. Yeah. It's always great to have you. Seth, are you have any Thank podcasts you. you want to plug? Uh, we got the Electric Podcast, 9 to 5 Max got a couple podcasts, 9 to 5 Google's got a couple podcasts. There's even a 9 to 5 Toys podcast. Toys? Uh, podcast. Ooh, is that new? Uh, no, that's that's our uh, new products and deals site. Oh, I get it. I get it. Sure. And, we also, and, and we also have a uh, drone site called DroneDJ.com. Oh, I forgot about that. And Flo We're expanding. is on, besides all about Android, the material podcast with some guy named Andy and Nako. Mm -hmm, on the Real FM network. We really post every Thursday. Nice. We thank you for being here. We had a great studio audience. Thank you, guys. We, we kind of tricked you by starting the show early but you've got more than enough i'm sure if you want to be in the studio uh survive the long march that is twit you can just email tickets at twit.tv we'll put a chair out for you you can also watch the live stream we have audio and video at twit.tv slash live if you're doing that join us in the chat room that's where everybody else watching live hangs out irc.twit.tv morning noon and night there's always somebody at irc.twit.tv TV. This show is available, like all our shows, on demand, so you can listen at your leisure at our website, twit.tv. I know a lot of people like to subscribe on our podcast apps. There are lots of great podcast apps out there, Stitcher, Slacker, Spotify, Google, Apple's Podcast, Pocket Cast. Pick one you like, subscribe. That way, uh, Twit will be ready for you for your Monday morning commute. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Another Twit. It's, it's amazing. Amazing.